General, uh, what do most truck drivers do when they take take time off? I, I've heard that um, some go bowling, others trans, translate uh, Nor- Norwegian poetry. What what do you, what do you normally do? Do you are you a bowler or are you more of a Norwegian translator? Well, since since I've never taken any time off, uh, this is the first time off. There had been a big plan. I had a big plan to take off, maybe like a month and a half, two months, and I was going to complete the Canute Hampson translation, uh, a final edit on these poems from Norwegian to English, as well as the introduction and some notes and various stuff. And I was also going to work on the uh, the Home Depot Profiles and Courage, adding another uh, final, massively epic story that kind of brought the whole there, collection there together. There are untold stories in Home Depot Chronicles? Yeah, there's... <sighs> There's are they, are they stories have. that you've never shared with anybody, like in Haven't conversation? Sh- well, I have maybe shared them in part, but um, there's some. There's some. I, I don't think I was a good enough writer then to be able to pull off uh, what what I could have pulled off. And now I feel like there's there's a lot of characters which I left out, which I didn't really like. Uh, could could you rewrite you know, been the talking, whole book? I, no, no, no. I'm just gonna add like a, a longer story. Um, that would that would more carefully and uh, specifically show kind of the abuse of the workers by management as well as uh, some funny stuff. And, oh, it would be uh, stories about how you abused workers? Yeah, not how I abused the workers. I was never management. But, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, when I say management, that, that should be quotes because around management because these are, these are workers that they, they uh, sort of uh, entice and dangle a carrot in front of for a few years and then award them with a management position. But really that means that they could just persecute the other workers. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but the whole idea of Home Depot is, is that the bonuses of the so-called management are on the backs of the regular workers. So if they can cut hours out of those workers uh, weekly uh, work time, those hours then go of of payment then go into some sort of a bonus pool that a fraction of it would then get rewarded to management. So it's in the best interest of management to deny work to the people that uh, work below them, quote unquote, even though they were in that position themselves. It's 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 a very incestuous, uh, and I mean incestuous in the worst sort of way, um, kind of system where you have labor attacking labor. It's just so well designed. Anyway, so I wanted to, to try and write something that could bring that out. I mean, not specifically, but um, within the context of idiots uh, like Slick Nick and um, and Robert the Jew and uh, and uh, Jay, who was a, a renegade uh, alcoholic now riddled with uh, cancer, kicked out of the Kraft family and denied the fortune who shoots guns at subway drivers and things. Jay, Jay know, the little... renegade cancerous alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a place for all these people. And uh, and I wasn't a good enough writer years ago to be able to, to bring it all together. But somehow in these last years, in this, uh, in this great golden age that's been happening around us, man, uh, I, I see the way forward. And I know this. This is the this is the work that has to go into the collection. So anyway, the the idea though is that this book would be finished during this period of time off, as well as the Hampson uh, book, uh, and then I would uh, go back to some sort of trucking. But it turns out that I've it seems that I've got to pick up a job in trucking that's going to start like right now. Um, so my time now is suddenly limited. Although I would have the summer off again. Now, have so, you uh, have you actually? translated the full book or or did you just write the introduction no the full book's done uh, jesus christ um you, you've seen you've, you've seen you, some of the poems it took me a year it took me a year to translate the book uh i finished probably like uh four or five months ago and i and i just kind of stopped i was tired of it and i and i didn't and I was still trucking pretty hard so i didn't have the time to do an, an, a good translator's introduction yeah. I mean, in fact, I was able to do that this week in the last four days or five days. But, well, uh, you you just I read, read it to me. you earlier, and it's yeah, it's it's pretty good. It's yeah, pretty you, good. You, it's... you you read to me, and I and you, and I I'd, I'd actually like to hear it again. Um, in, in in a few minutes, if you could, if you could read it again, 
Um, I, I, I haven't ever heard uh, an introduction that, that incredible. I, I thought you had uh, found some scholarly work written perhaps a long time ago or perhaps some contemporary uh, um, what, what language is uh, Norwegian? I thought you had found some Norwegian book, and you would translate her. No. You would translate an introduction. It it, it 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 blew my mind. But but I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it. Yeah, but you know but, what it is. You know what it is. It's it's very hard to write a good translator's introduction. Most most books that are in translation uh, are, are are begin with some some really terrible introduction, which is it has no literary merit to it. And it doesn't really always provide a lot of good biographical information. I mean, what do you want out of a good introduction? I mean, essentially, you, you want something like, you know, like with a great jazz album, you want to have great liner notes, you know? You want something that doesn't distract from the music, but which provides something that um, the music, that, that gives you some insight into the music, <clears throat> that, that provides um, some way in that, uh, that colors what is to follow. And I mean, if you, you don't want to be too heavy-handed, but I mean, most, I, most I got done. Have I got done listening notes. to your to your introduction. I wanted to pick up the fucking book immediately. I had never been so excited. It was like, um, <laughs> it was like, yeah. it was, it was, it was like, you, you know, you know the, the the sport luge. You stop. You you start at the top of this this huge sled hill, and then you go all the way down until you pick up a crazy ass amount of speed, and then you get launched into the air. I felt like I was just getting launched into the air when your when your translator's introduction. Now the only thing you didn't do is you didn't refer to yourself enough in the first person. I hope you corrected that or in the third person. Um, you need a lot, you need at least thirty references to the translator. So that that that's that's my only commentary. But uh, I I I've never been. I, I knew not, I knew none of that about Hansen. I I'd, well I'd, there's there's such a, there's such good good biographical information. Um, and material to include with the uh, the gambling and the drunkenness and uh, everyone likes to hear about gambling and drunkenness and a guy just destroying his life, especially someone who's who's been very successful and is remembered. Uh, everyone just feels better about themselves to read that. Uh, but he he did get his work done, and he did uh, drag himself through a lot of depravity. And uh, I tried to I tried to put that in the. Uh, in the introduction. I'm shocked because I thought this guy was like a total, uh, I, 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 I thought that he didn't have much of a, of a crazy life. I didn't think he was a Dostoevsky. Oh my God. He had a uh, wild, wild. I mean, of course I did not mention anything about Nazism and his support of Hitler and about how they, the Norwegians after the end of the world war two, because of his support of Hitler stripped him of all of his assets and he died like in his 90s, wrapped in newspapers, cold and freezing in his Nordland uh, home, uh, penniless and uh, blind, not really able to see. Uh, I mean, there's just extraordinary stuff about Hampson. I, there's very few people that live such a full, full life. I mean, he even spent time in America. He wrote a book that, that rips apart America called uh, A Critique of the Cultural Life of America or something like that. Uh, as have a you, very have young you, man, have you, he went, have you read that? I ha I've read parts of it. Uh, I really want to get a copy. Um, I've been looking for one. I have to get one. But um, you know, I mean, you know just, what, you know what, you can do. Um, I have access uh, as a, as some alumni association. I have access to the University of Texas Research Library, and I think I can get them to mail me books that I can check out. And so what I can do is I can I can send it over to you, and you can scan it. I don't know if you've ever been to a library, but they have these uh, scanning machines. Where yeah, you just... but but you know what? I, I really that's it, 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 with Hampson. I would prefer to own the book. So probably buy I'm it on eBay. Buy or a something. Cop. Yeah, or yeah, Amazon, yeah. I mean, the interesting thing is though is I don't know if you've seen if you look to buy books, but uh, at least the prices books are offered at are quite high. Um, I think there's there's been a real inflation in the prices of physical objects suddenly. Maybe because of all these millennials who have grown up with digitized versions of music and books. That's true. Maybe they've they've suddenly come around to wanting to own physical versions of things, and the supply is actually so limited in, uh, uh, for for music and for and for physical copies of books that um, you know it's possible for for scrupulous 
or unscrupulous sellers on Amazon and uh, eBay to offer these things at just really inflated prices compared to what we've known. P publishing in general, publishing them. in general is is, is hurting. Uh, whether it's it's newspapers, periodicals, or or books. Um, well, I'm talking about secondary sellers of stuff. I, I actually think secondary sellers of stuff always make the most money. The people that originate stuff never m really make much at all. Like you know, a painter, a painter never really makes much money, and people will say. Oh God! Look at the price of those Van Goghs going at Sotheby's, or you know the auction houses, or even the auction houses for like a David Hockney, or you know someone who's still alive. And you'd say, well, the guy must be making a lot of money. But no, those are secondary sales made by an auction house between owners and and, and new owners. And I think the same thing is true with books and records. The the original producers of all this stuff are really denied the the, uh, the the inflationary value that happens over time, particularly when it becomes something that that is in demand. And, I mean, and as you know, in like a uh, in a in a, in a credit fiat bus uh, fiat based uh, economy like we live in, there's all this money floating around looking for uh, new markets and uh, new new dwindling supplies with which to create new value and create new investments. And I think in some ways, books and records, old steel bicycles, any sort of artifacts. Uh, I mean, watch uh, the Antique Roadshow and stuff like that. Anything is being bid up now. There's just so much money floating around. And it, and it, you know, it trickles down to, to use books itself that are selling for a lot more than they ever did before. Um, and it, it's a testament to uh, those sellers that they can post these ridiculous prices. I mean, I see a lot of ridiculous prices. Um, for books, uh, particularly for jazz records, I've been watching them carefully. Occasionally, you see someone who doesn't know what something's worth posted, or someone who's desperate, and those are the only sales that are that are worth uh, making. Well, the only worth making. The only LP that I care about, and it's still uh, priced very reasonably, is the uh, Charles Olson reads from Maximus poems LP. Um, did that, you did you ever own that? I, I can't I can't remember. I, I might have owned it. I don't think you ever owned it. I thought you made a copy of it. At, at I had I had an audio so. recording of it. Uh, yeah, you know I've been I've been looking for that. Um, I I saw actually I saw a sealed copy come up. I think um, saw maybe within the last year on eBay a sealed copy, but they wanted like uh, I don't know. It was it was quite a bit of money that someone wanted. I need for it. I need to get my shit together and and get an LP. I I was happier. God I. I used to just listen to LPs and I need to just give up fucking women and just listen to records again. I was far happier when I did that. General, why, why don't you go ahead and read your uh, introduction? I, I want to see if I notice any changes or notice anything different. Um, but I, I just, I just, it's, it's, it's worth listening to again. I think it was the, the greatest introduction to a book of poetry I've ever, I've ever heard. <laughs> it was, yeah, it's definitely the greatest. Stuff in the graves. It, well, this will inspire the readers, this the listeners, um, to want to become readers. Uh, all these podcast people just fucking listen and don't want to read. Well, here it is. Here it is. You should read, motherfucker. Read. Here it is. Translator's introduction. The Wild Chorus was the only book of poetry Canute Hampson published during his lifetime. Its 1904 publication concluded a 10-year period in which Hampson mostly turned away from the novel producing instead four plays, a verse drama, and a travelogue of the Far East. These were restless and tumultuous years both personally and creatively, and he traveled widely. The stays in Copenhagen, Oslo, Paris, and Munich, a long trip through Finland, Russia, and the Orient, and finally a return to his birthplace in the rural north of Norway. The majority of the poems in this collection were written around the time of Hamsen's doomed 1898 marriage to Berglio Beck Gopfert, their relationship, begun two years earlier while Berglio was married to her first husband, drew the ire of a woman named Anna Munch, who had been stalking Hampson since 1891. Munch sent anonymous poison pen letters to everyone associated with Hampson and Berglio, from family members to owners of cafes they frequented, describing him as a dissolute seducer of wealthy married women and an idler who is not even the author of his own books. Ironically, both Berglio's father and the police came to suspect Hampson of the letter writing in an effort to bring about Berglio's divorce and then, later, to avoid marrying her after he had changed his mind. By then, Hampson had indeed changed his mind, but was compelled to marry to disprove the lies written about him 
and put to an end Munch's campaign. In the months following the wedding, Hamson quickly wrote the novella Victoria, but thereafter unhappiness set in for the couple, and for the next four years Hamson published nothing. In a late 1898, Hamson wrote to his friend, I am tired of the novel and I have always despised drama. I have begun writing poetry, the only form of writing that is both pretentious and meaningless. Oh, that is not both pretentious and meaningless, only meaningless. Struggling to write, he traveled to his childhood home at Hameroy, which he had not seen in 25 years. There Hamson lived in a turf hut and completed the verse drama Friar Vent, with the Nordland fjords, forests, and seasons providing inspiration for his poetry. The natural world, though impartial, appears throughout these poems as a consoling force to be giving gratitude in life as well as in death. Nature Hampson experiences alone, with his impressions taking the form of fleeting lyrical effusions, mystical and pantheistic. The best known of these nature poems is The Scary, where, using the Norwegian folk song form Stev, the reader is transported in a sort of Norse funeral boat ride towards a flower-covered island to the sound of thunder. Other experiments with meter and stanza heighten the lyrical effect of the poems and parallel the music of nature they invoke. From the forest sowing in the night to its silences, the creaking fir trees, falling pine needles, the howling of the wind, the kinking of sun-burnt stalks, and the sea crashing against the rocks. Perhaps fittingly, given his marital troubles, With Red Roses begins the book with a man on his knees, begging his estranged lover to remember the good times. Nearly a third of the poems address some aspect of love, from seduction, lust, anticipation, and separation, to the longing of an aged virgin. Berglio herself appears as Elvilde in Fever Poem, an anguished multi-part epic in which Hamson alternates between scenes from their relationship and questions about why he was given life before ending on a hesitantly optimistic note. With no money coming in from his writing, Hamson in 1901 secretly gambled and lost his wife's inheritance in the casinos. He then borrowed money from friends to replenish her account, but foolishly gambled that away as well. Heavy drinking further compounded his inability to write, with self-recrimination and guilt providing the impetus for From the Arches and the renowned poem, In One Hundred Years All is Forgotten, a rejection of his fame, his writing, and of life itself. Other poems are purely didactic, from his questioning of the origins of sexual desire in the sigh of creation, to a comparison of Christianity and Islam in a consideration Letter to Byron in Heaven remains controversial for its attack on feminism, progress, and democracy. Although the Wild Chorus sold nowhere near enough copies to satisfy Hamson's gambling debts, the critical response upon publication in 1904 was generally positive, and the initial print run sold quickly. In Norway, the book inspired a revival of lyric poetry on the subjects of love and nature, and the work of the poets Hermann Wildenve and Olaf Boll. To these days, these poems continue to be read and have been set to music and sung by folk and opera singers. Though more than 100 years have now passed, these poems have not been forgotten. Jesus, that is that is such a fucking rip snorter. I took I took notes and I have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 ideas from the translator's introduction. Um Jesus, Jesus Christ. And, and, and one, of my, uh, one of my notes was in, in 100 years is, is all forgotten. And uh, it's, it's incredible that, uh, that there's somebody who's alive, who's a truck driver, who has basically resurrected this motherfucker in, in English. Um, he most likely has been forgotten in his own native land. No, that's not true <clears throat> at all. He's, he's, he's very popular. Um, his popularity has returned in Norway. Uh, as I mentioned before about his, his unfortunate uh, support of Nazism and Hitler, and I don't mean unfortunate as a criticism, I just mean as unfortunate. For, it's been unfortunate for his legacy and all of the great <laughs> works that he wrote. Yeah. Um, these, these, these books were mostly suppressed. You don't want to religions. alienate your Nazi, your Nazi readers. Yeah, but I mean, I don't, I don't want, I don't want, I don't. I, his support of Hitler was 
was not support of killing Jews. It was support of the destruction of England. Um, Hampson hated the English. He felt the English and their way of industrialization and capitalism was going to turn Norway and especially the North, which he loved, into this terrible place where bankers and financiers controlled uh, the countryside instead of the people that tilled the land and worked on the land. I mean, he was right in that sense. He was very critical of, of, of countries, um, other countries that had embraced uh, banking and the English way, like uh, Switzerland, who he called a, uh, a country of shopkeepers. Uh, I mean, he just he just despised the English, and he was hopeful that Hitler would 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 win out and crush the English. I, How on all earth? throughout his books, always no, he I mean, hated the English people. I, the English people always appeared yeah. as idiots and yeah. people to be ridiculed in his books. I'm I'm absolutely mesmerized by the breadth and depth and variety and originality of of the topics. Not really having read much of his poetry, I just. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm intensely curious curious about. Well, no about, one's read his poetry. I mean, no one, no English speaker. Only Norwegians have ever read the poetry. I mean, that's the thing. Uh, well, that's not true. They were translated. There was a translation done in. Um, I actually have the book here. It's a beautiful book. It was it was a uh, they someone translated his poetry into German. I think it was 1911. Uh, and I have the original book here. I was able to purchase it online and have it shipped from Munich. Beautiful, beautiful book. Uh, a first edition. It w- wasn't even very expensive, uh, it, but it, it, that that edition includes a uh, an introduction, a uh, foreword by Hampson, translated from the Norwegian into German. But the letter in Norwegian uh, from that foreword has been lost. So, in fact, I, I also made a German translation to English uh, of that um, foreword from this German translation edition of his poetry. And it's it's a it's it's a very important one because it, it he talks about his, you know how he composed these poems and you know a lot of good stuff in there. So that's also going to be part of this book. I, I won't read that to you, but is is there um, any similarity between German and Norwegian? Were you able to follow? There them? is, uh, there is, there are some there are some similarities. Um, I mean, given given that Norwegian and and Danish are close and Denmark is a neighboring country to to Germany, I mean there is some overlap, but. Um, um, yeah, I don't, I don't speak, uh, I don't know Norwegian or German, uh, but that's not the important point. I, I mean, a did, translator, did you, it's did not. You, did you find a it a hindrance that, that, that your, your lack of, I, I thought your um, introduction would include a reference to the fact that among the obstacles in my, my, my translation of this work was my lack of familiarity with the, uh, the Norwegian language. Um, no, I, I it, 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 it's a misconception about translation that you need to really, really know the language that you're translating from. Uh, the most important thing is the language that you're translating into. And if you don't have a really, really careful and rigorous, when I say rigorous, I'm invoking philosophically rigorous and, uh, and, 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 and everything to do with that uh, uh, attention to your own language. And if you haven't ever given that attention to your own language, you're not going to be able to understand how to produce the effects uh, of those uh, of what's trying to you know what's being done in the source language in your own language uh, because you're never gonna master you're never gonna master that that other language as much as your own now but did, so did many you find it, did you find it useful so many, to read his poetry yeah well I mean I, did, look, were, the, were you, were you, were you reading his poetry about, when you when you translated it or did you just kind of have a feeling of him and you just wrote your own poetry. Well, I'd long had a feeling for Hampson. He's, he's been my brother for many years from when I, when I read hunger, uh, which is about basically about him and Oslo wandering around trying to write and not obviously not having anything to eat. And he kind of chews on his finger and he, even when he gets money, he gives it away instead of buying food. Oh, that was and, the one where he gives the coat away. Yeah, he does yes. everything. God, I mean it's, uh, I mean it's just, and I tried reading that. The next, I, I tried reading Hunger. Do you know? Do you know why I had to stop? I, I know it disturbed you. It disturbed it, it you. It made it was me. The wrong time. I, I, I was. It was in a period of my life when I was feeling very sad. Um, I, uh, I think I had fallen through the cracks. Um, I had, I think I had come. 
back from Brazil and I was a very broken person. And uh, I, was, I was writing and, and, and I think my, my thinking was, was prolific and, and very fruitful, but I felt very isolated and alienated. Uh, it was some, something of a reverse culture shock. And I was living in a college town and I, I felt no connection among any of the, uh, the students, which was unfortunate because typically university towns are, are bastions of social intercourse and intellectual debate. And I felt really, really nothing there. But you, you, you kept sending me these extraordinarily disturbing books and Hampson's misfortunes. <laughs> Hampson's mis- I, was having, I was having a series of misfortunes, um, a lot of problems. And uh, I was just trying to survive and, 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 and do something productive. And uh, I felt like this, this guy's life was, was <laughs> so, so akin to mine. I, I, I had to put it down. And I, I thought you were trying to torture me. I thought you were finding, <laughs> I thought you were finding literature that, that would weaken and break my spirit. But in fact, but in, but, in, but in fact, yeah. now, now that I, uh, now that I'm back above the cracks uh, through which I had fallen previously, I'm, I, I, I feel that this, this, this work really says something about the human condition or I believe I believe you would recognize him as a kindred spirit as a brother um, and the and the incredible thing is is that he lived so long ago especially and he produced these works from so long ago this is probably the 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 earliest works of literature that I have such a direct connection to uh, and I think you would as well uh, his second book mysteries is also extraordinary uh, the only other books that I that I that I would say are are as powerful were also powerful books and influences on Hampson, which are the, the Russians, Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, um, Gorky, Turgenev. Uh, so I mean, there, there, there's kind of a loose group of uh, of of writers who who really lived extraordinary lives and were able to have the strength also to be able to write stuff uh, and write truly and honestly uh, about what they had learned from from the depths that they'd come back from you know guys like you know Dostoevsky Hampson is right there and um, in many ways Hampson is still being discovered again and rediscovered because of that whole Nazism thing uh, you know with the with the ambivalence about accepting Nazis you know uh, in it at least at univer- at the university level perhaps he's not being read but at the uh, the public level um, in Norway, people are a little more comfortable with them. I mean, you kind of have to let the uh, the generation that knew the Nazis and was hurt by the Nazis let them die, and new generations will show up who will be able to recognize the work for what it was. Particularly since all of these great um, works were written prior to the existence of Nazism, so it's there, so it's wrong to tar an entire guy's work as being a Nazi. There, there were a whole of series of that. there was a, there were a whole series of. Uh, Scientists, economists, philosophers, literary critics, poets, and writers who um, got got uh, caught up in 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 the, in the Nazi thing, and they they right after the war ended, um, anybody that uh, any of the uh, Hitler, or any of the Nazis owned, any any anybody in the library was blacklisted. Um, there were there were, there were, there are several American writers too that were once very popular, very important writers, but because they were associated, I mean what. World War II really, really fucked up um, a lot of people. It was it was a nasty war, um, and it was it was nasty because we were we were fighting a uh, a country that was had had a great intellectual kinship to us for, forever. Um, it seemed like the last country we'd ever go to war with, um, and uh, you know a, a lot was lost and destroyed in in the war. A lot a lot of great books that will uh, never uh, be rediscovered. Um, so well, I don't the, know. I, I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's never. I mean, those books are out there. Like there's the. Um, there, there were there were guys who supported Nazism that were much more, uh, much more virulent in their support, and, and also an anti anti semites anti semites guys like um, the French writer Louis Ferdinand Céline. Incredible uh, first book, Voyage au bout de la nuit. Uh, journey to the end of the night general you have to read that book it's just incredible it's about his experiences coming out of world war how do you uh, how do you how do you America. Oh, this is celine you're saying c-e-l-i-n-e yeah. is the last name if you look it up you'll you'll find him and journey to the by end the of the time, night by the time journey to the end of the night but 
that's the translation. By the by, the time of World War II came around, though, he was an, he was just a total Nazi supporter and an anti Semite. And he, I mean, some people believe that he this book that he wrote, um, uh, just <laughs> it's extraordinarily bad. It's just this this terrible anti Semite Semitic uh, uh, essay. Some people believe that that was satire, or these are the apologists, I suppose. I don't. I I really don't know. Um, but. I have to stand with his 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 first books, which were brilliant, and uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, they're they're, they're they're character failings in any sort of a man, uh, you know. And uh, we just happen to live in a very sensitive time, which um, which says that you can burn a man's books and ban somebody uh, based on uh, perhaps some sort of belief or anything that he were to say on the side. Uh, you know, they call this political correctness and everything, but. But it's destructive in the sense that um, we're not able to accept ideas from some very important thinkers and writers and to try and advance them and carry them forward. We just have to ban them and, and, and destroy these ideas because of, you know, some personal remarks they might have made. Um, you know, I think of Heidegger, too. I mean, it's just been wrong what they've done to Heidegger um, and to try and read being in time as a Nazi text. It, it's completely wrong. I mean, you know Nietzsche... Nietzsche, Nietzsche is, is, is associated with Nazism, and he was dead, uh, insane and dead from syphilis long before, 30 years before a Nazi even existed. I mean, this, this, um, this charge of Nazism is, has become one of the really the worst charges. You know, you know, getting more contemporary, these Antifa people, I don't know how much you know about them. They, 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 when they label someone a Nazi, it's open season for punching someone and beating them with sticks. So... Uh, I mean, it's just a it's just a very strange time um, to use this charge, and um, you know I'm not even sure we really understand what Nazism was. You know the way people use the word fascism, it they they misapply the word fascism. You know it's I don't want to you know there's no reason to get into debate of this political and historical stuff, but um, it's certainly it's certainly become a button word for uh, for violence and banning and suppressing things. And at least in the case of Hamsun in Norway, the Norwegians have finally begun to move on and begun to celebrate Hamsun again. Although, I mean, I say celebrate Hamsun again, they were always still reading Hamsun. They just didn't want to admit it. Um, so the more Hamsun can be translated, I mean, more books are, have been coming out. A, a, a very important translator of Hamsun just died recently um, who, had, who had produced some very good translations uh, of the novels. So, uh, but in any case, those is the this, major is this guy American? Is this guy Nor level. Norwegian? What what is his uh, nationality? Uh, I think Norwegian American, Sver uh, Linkstrad. Did you did you, like did you ever reach out to the guy? Did you know him? Uh, he's 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 in, he's dead now. Um, no, I never reached out to him. Uh, you know, I wouldn't know what to say to any of these translators. I'm a truck driver. You know, uh, I, I'm a truck driver who 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 really likes Hampson, and uh, and I found that there were certain works of his that I was curious about that had never been translated. I mean, that's, that's how this began. I wanted to read, I wanted to read in 100 years, all is forgotten and no one had translated it. I wanted to read a uh, fever poem and no one had translated it. I wanted to read, I mean, I wanted to read all this stuff and um, I couldn't, I couldn't find it. Or if I did find some translations, I thought they were really bad. I, I was not impressed. And uh, that was another thing that led me to get, that gave me confidence in doing this translation was because the, the translations, the very few that were inclu included in Scandinavian poetry anthologies, I found to be terrible, terrible translations. And not, not because they, the people translating didn't know Norwegian, which they certainly did. They were Norwegians or Swedes that were making the translations. It was because they didn't understand poetry and the poetry of the English language. And they didn't understand the English language, which gets back to my, my original point, which is that they were creating very stilted literal translations. Translation is all translations. about the language mm -hmm. you're translating to, yeah. not the translation, uh, not the language that you're translating from. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the whole deal with, you know, saying you don't know this language well enough to translate from it is it's just sort of a cop out to protect, protect the, uh, you know, the tenures, the tenure, the, the, the tenured professors who are professors of these languages and who are offering degrees in study of this language in literature and comparative well, literature well, to, I, I, to I do think, translations. I think the takeaway it's is a, that if, if you're not yourself a talented philosopher and writer, 
you, you can't have a, a shot at being a good translator. Similarly, I think Beiser is a very talented philosopher who just never did his own work, but his history of philosophy reveals that he is a deeply talented uh, philosopher. His, his work on uncovering Look, some of the most obscure guy, German thinkers. That guy thinkers. puts himself down. That guy puts himself down and he says, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not this, I'm not that. But you cannot write a great history that's captivating if you don't know philosophy at a deep, deep level. Uh, and he does. And he's also got a tremendous capacity with the English language. So, I mean, he's doing original translations from German to English. Um, and he's also capturing the energy of the time and the poetry of, uh, and, and, and the rhythms of the language and being able to convert that into English. And, into, into, and well, like you, it, but like you in your introduction, in like you in your introduction, he's digging very deeply about the past. What, what was this guy doing? I, knowing what I know now about Hampson and his, his gambling and his failed marriage and his, uh, living in the earthen hut in, in the north, um, the fact that he was influenced by the topography of a fjord. Fjord is a great, great topographical feature. I've actually experienced it as you have in, in Patagonia. Um, the, these are all things that are absolutely essential to understand. And I think people that have experienced the wilderness and traveled in the way you and I have um, understand that this is necessary information. What was this man's environment? Um, yeah, but you know, the most for the most part, the people that are, are making translations and are writing books are people that have never ventured out of their little college town where they have tenure. Um, Beiser, as we know, Beiser, I, I mean, we don't really know the whole story. We never really learned the whole story of Frederick Beiser. But um, as you presented him, he was something of a badass who lived in a, a so-called Hinterhof, yeah. which was a, uh, an apartment created between the the brick walls of two buildings that were close together. Yeah. <laughs> which seems, which is extraordinary. I, he I he mean, wrote his first grade book in total obscurity uh, outside of the university. Um, he would get these little uh, donations and funding um, advances from these uh, organizations in Germany called Stiftungs. And uh, he was this, this guy who studied at Oxford who suddenly just reinvented himself in, in Berlin in the early 80s. He had long hair and a beard and uh, spent all of his time. And, and the other thing is that he was very good at corralling the help of many individuals to help him with his research. He would go into a library and all of the librarians realized he was a genius. And he was requesting the most obscure uh, letters and pamphlets and magazines that no one had ever uncovered since they were first written and sent in the mail a hundred years previously. And he was pouring through all of this and, and then reinvigorating the, 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 the lives of, of, of these people, putting himself back into the time frame. And what he was, and his conclusion was, you guys don't get any of this. If you don't put yourself back into the period and read all the journals and all the articles and understand all the debates and all of the players. I mean, this is his whole observation about German pessimism. He said Nietzsche was one of like 60 guys. And if we re revisit the actual history, we'll see that Nietzsche's not as original as, as, as we think. He was just one of 60 guys. It was just because of somebody like Kaufman or just because of Nietzsche's chance popularity that we think that he was just the only guy who was writing about this stuff, that it was just like Schopenhauer and then Nietzsche. But uh, he, uh, he did tons of work. And, uh, and, and that's very, very, very hard. And he had to go to some these obscure libraries, get the hell out of the university, and, and, and do this stuff and make friends with, with librarians in, in Germany. Um, but I wanted to switch back to your uh, to your book. You uh, you got familiar with with Hampson by reading his uh, his fiction or his novels, and then you chose to uh, translate his poetry. What what is do you see a difference between his his fiction and his poetry? Ham Hampson himself said that uh, his fiction was um, how did how did he criticize the fiction and, and go to poetry? He said that it was. The fiction was what no. superfluous. Well, there, there was, no, there was that. There was that line in a letter in the late eighteen uh, nineties to a friend where he he kind of. I mean, he was suffering from the inability to write, uh, and he turned away from the novel, and he'd even become disgusted with with trying to write drama, and so he turned to poetry. Um, 
But he he later on condemned all his poetry and burned it all and said it was just stupid. <laughs> That's what he said. At now, the end now, but by, by, uh, by burning it, did he just burn the original manuscripts or or, or was some no, of it preserved? He, he had written more poems. He had apparently written more poems, but he he burned them, and uh, he didn't want he didn't want them to be published. Uh, he he was never very supportive of the you know he. he his poetry kind of spawned this this lyrical uh, poetic movement in Norway, uh, but he was never very supportive of it. He kind of moved on. He was always moving on, you know, the things that he did. The The first novel, Hunger, was followed by Mysteries, which was then followed by Pan. And these novels, um, he'd also given a lecture tour uh, to coincide with these novels where he attacked the foremost writer in Norway at the time, uh, Henrik Ibsen. Now, Hampson was, was still in his late 20s and relatively unknown. And he toured around Norway paying for these, these lectures himself, declaring Ibsen a fool and a fraud and a worthless writer. This is the, this is the most important writer in Norway at the time. I, Ibsen was a, a very, very uh, influential and famous uh, p- playwright as well. Exactly. Um, Sartre exactly. Sart read him. I, and, and, and Ibsen might have won the Nobel Prize. Am I, am I wrong? Uh, he might have. I mean, he's he's he was at the time he was the biggest Norwegian author, perhaps the biggest author in Scandinavia. And Hamson went on this. He paid it his own way on this lecture circuit to go around Scandinavia. Uh, well, I think Norway mostly, but yeah, I think he went to uh, Copenhagen as well, just attacking viciously Ibsen. You know, but it, these were personal attacks as well. And finally, Ibsen came to one of these lectures and sat in the front row. And Hampson unloaded on the guy, and Ibsen sat there and just took it all. Uh, I, Hampson was just—he was just fearless, and a part of this fearlessness came from his his lack of confidence in terms of uh, having a traditional education. You know, he he came out of the north of Norway, the rural north. He never went to a university. He had to work as a manual laborer. He had to go to America and work as a manual laborer. Um, he had suffered so much. And so he had just contempt for all of these, these upper-class writer people. And uh, his idea, was, though, was to write a whole new kind of literature that was more real, that was deeper psychologically, that got into the unconscious mind and all these things. And so he, this, this is really what his lectures were about. And really what hunger was a demonstration of and mysteries was a demonstration of, which is just the the sort of absurdities of the mind. And you, I mean, just carrying these things out to their end, you just don't know where they'll end up. And uh, in many, you know, today these, these books are considered to be the first example of modern literature. They were influential for Hemingway, for Henry Miller, um, for Bukowski, uh, that, that, that LA poet, um, for so many people. Uh, and Celine, Louis Ferdinand de Celine, who we were just discussing earlier, I don't believe he would exist if not for Hampson. So, I mean, Hampson, Hampson, for me, became the key to, uh, to all of these later writers who I did like already, and I suddenly realized where it was coming from. It was coming from this wild man from Norway uh, who lived this incredible life, and, and, um, but who was always honest about, about what he was and what he wanted and, and the next thing he was going to do. There was, just, there was just never any bullshit with him. No, no, so he had really no formal university education of any sort? No, no. And I mean, that was one of the reasons he came to America. Uh, you know, this was the great uh, Scandinavian migration to America, the same migration uh, on the tail end of it that my, my great grandfather uh, came to Ellis Island on. But uh, Swedish, you know, America Swedish was, grandfather, uh, great grandfather. Yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, the community of the Scandinavian Swedes, Danes, and Norwegians was all kind of close. Um, he lived. He lived for a time. Actually, Hampson lived for a time actually in Chicago and was a uh, a streetcar conductor. Um, but he was he was so negligent with the names of the streets. Apparently, he would just kind of call out any name um, <laughs> because in those days, yeah, he'd just drive by and he'd just call out Adam Street, Adam Street, and it wasn't Adam Street at all. People would get off. They get that. <laughs> it's just. Just, just extraordinary stuff. That, that yeah. I mean, that, that would be like that would be like my going to China and just trying to be a streetcar conductor and just 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 rattle off the, the couple mandarin words that I, I had memorized 
Yeah. Um, we should uh, we should try to find out like if there is a an old section of of streetcar tracks left in Chicago. And next time I'm there, I'll, I'll try to I'll try to visit that place and photograph it. Or or remember when we um, try to retrace some of the steps of Charles Olson in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Uh, th- well, that was that was there were probably more uh, more left of uh, ha- uh, of Olson and Gloucester than there was in, than there will be in of Hampson and Chicago. I, but, I don't uh, I don't think we've ever talked about um, that that journey or ha- have we in previous podcasts? Well. No, we've never talked about it. Uh, I mean, you know, in many in many ways, Olson 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 has similarities to Hampson, at least for me, because these are these are guys these are guys. Uh, you know, there's a brotherhood. There's a brotherhood. If you're very serious about reading, and I don't, I don't mean sitting around reading to fucking read and getting a library card and going to school and writing about something for a class. If you're fucking serious about reading and you're open to something changing your life. You know, and giving you giving you some new idea that you'll pursue in your own life and see where you can take it. Then there are certain writers and painters and musicians, you know, people from who have done things artistically and creatively that can be influential. And it might not just be their art that's influential. It might just it, it might be actually the way they live their life. And I I think for you and I, uh, the most influential people have been people who have been not only uh, productive. In terms of stuff, making stuff that we have appreciated and felt strongly about, but they, their own lives, have been reflective of the the, the kind of stuff they were doing. Whether it's Wittgenstein, who is untouchable, he's he's a badass. Uh, Olson Olson is up there. Um, Olson's a badass too. I mean, Hampson's a badass. I mean, there's a list of badasses that I would put forward. You know, if some young kid came to me and is like, "Who should I read? Who should I listen to? What paintings should I seek out in the world to see?" Uh, what music, you know, all that. I could give a list because there, there are, there are some badasses that were just doing stuff that was untouchable, and it may not have been appreciated during their time. For the most part, these guys weren't. But um, you know, Hamson was one. Olson is one. Uh, I don't, you know, the critical acclaim for Olson has never come around, and it, and it probably won't. I think he was, I think he was probably more like a uh, a poet's poet. You know, he, he was influential with other poets who probably became famous. You know, guys like Creeley and, and Ginsburg and Leroy Jones and Mary Baraka. Um, they all were influenced by, you know, and then the Black Mountain scene. You, you ever hear about, you know, the Black Mountain College and all that that he was with uh, R- Robert Creeley? And uh, I can't remember any of the other. Well, uh, Creeley was there, but I mean, there was a whole, I mean, the Black Mountain in North—I guess it was in North Carolina. Merce Mer- Mer- Cunningham, Merce Cunningham. Yeah, they had the dance. They had um, Franz Klein, the incredible painter. I think Robert Rauschenberg, the painter, was there. Uh, Wasn't the architect um, who created those Buckminster uh, Fuller? Yeah, Buckminster, Buckminster Fuller. Fuller. Yeah, yeah, he was there. I mean, this was just. I mean, if this college was around, uh, I would have to go to it. I'm sure. Jesus he Christ, was wasn't I mean, wasn't Olson incredible. wasn't Olson the uh, president? He was a rector. They called it the, called I him mean, the rector. I mean, one of the most chaotic, disorganized, spastic human beings. Yeah, trying I don't know to, how they made him rector. <laughs> he was... Uh, who was the plant, well, who was the the plant college, manager? Who was, was it the plant manager, Charles? You always... I mean, you know, um, your characterization of the plant manager, Charles, not, not in your work, but in our conversations, you said the reason why the plant is so chaotic and things are so tough at times... Isn't isn't due to Are the you fact talking about Alaska? Yeah, You're talking about Charles in Alaska. Yeah, yeah. You, you talked about the chaos of of Charles. Like he didn't think about the plant. He just thought about what he wanted to do at any given moment. If he wanted to hijack a forklift, or if he wanted to force uh, an entire day's work in two hours, or if he just he just wanted to get some adrenaline rush, he would give those orders, and there would be chaos. And inefficiency simply because of the fact that he wasn't aware of the plant. He was just aware of himself. Um, Olson was a very, very uh, grand. What's the word? Um, he, he was a man of what? What do they call it? Self grandeur, self importance. I can't. I'm, I'm grandiose. Grandiose. Yeah, that's that's the word. Um, and I, I can't imagine that 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 helping the the long term sustainability of like any well, institution. Well, Olson, Olson was. Uh... My impression of Olson was that he was just this huge, towering, lumbering man. 
um, who just on account of his, his size, physical size was awkward in the world. And the things he wanted to do in the world, he was six foot six. He weighed 300 pounds. He was massive. He was giant. What did he like to I eat mean, in bed? What was that? What, didn't he used to eat something strange? He, he used to eat cabbage. He eat cabbage all night in bed or something like that with all these books. Just, just, but, just large, just large. I mean, but cabbage. But heads. I mean, you know, he was a guy. He was a guy who wanted to go on fishing boats. I mean, Moby Dick was 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 his big influence. I mean, he he apparently was one of the discoverers of Moby Dick. I mean, Melville is remembered today predominantly because of the the scholarship Olson did. I mean, that's one of the things that's forgotten. I, and I don't understand how more people don't remark about that. Melville is appreciated today because of Charles Olson. Uh, and that's to say nothing about Call Me Ishmael, which is, which is a book he wrote, I think, prior to the whole revitalization of Melville. So I mean, there's a lot of interesting things. But I think what it comes down to is when I know when he lived in Gloucester, and we heard it from people who lived in Gloucester, Olson wanted to go out on fishing boats, but when he did, he was an embarrassment. He fell on the deck, and he was just too big and awkward. Um, oh Jesus Christ! It, How it could a guy him. like him? He couldn't even get in the in the in the, in the crew quarters to sleep at night. No, he wouldn't even He's be able to get big. in the fucking head to take a shit. Like how? Yeah, he wouldn't I mean, be you able and to I know he wouldn't get under the fucking you, bait you, shed, man. You and I know because we've been fishermen. Um, but all the scholars who write about Olsen, they say, they, they, I remember reading about him like, yeah, he fell on the deck and he was a failure as a fisherman. And uh, wait, 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 wait. The guy is six foot six. He weighs 300 pounds. How could he be a fisherman? You can't be a fisherman at that size. What can you do on a boat? You can't move around on a boat. You can't do anything on a boat. So, I mean, those scholars and those people who would criticize him as a failed fisherman, it's, yeah, it's just ridiculous. He could never be a fisherman. Never. It was impossible. You know, He's much better off as a poet. It, it, you know, I, I, I don't know if, if, if you have done something differently recently, or I just never noticed this about you. But I remember that when I was um, doing all kinds of reading in uh, early 2014 and then in um, early 2015, I was spending a lot of time in a university library and I was writing in, in reaction to a lot of um, academic or more rarefied work. And I, I felt like at the time you were writing more uh, visceral salt of the earth stories about South America and truck driving and Home Depot. And I almost felt a little bit guilty for my, my work being maybe too feet or too fancy. But suddenly, having listened to your introduction and your, your current articulation of uh, the history of a, of a writer and his influences, you you have you just been this way the whole time and I've just never noticed it but you're you're more articulate than college professors who specialize in this stuff and, and you're a truck driver is this just a recent development in in your intellectual yeah, history it, because you've been writing about someone else or, or have you really just been able to do this stuff your whole life but you've just chosen to not not do that because no. it, it's you, you have to mostly interact with truck drivers and, and dock deckhands and and look so interac forth. interacting with I wouldn't say interacting with uh, fishermen and deckhands and dock workers and truck drivers has been particularly helpful to being able to write clearly. I, I mean, all that introduction was, was being able to write clearly and combine a lot of ideas. Most people who write um, waste so many words. You know, they, 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 have, they have sentences which, which have things which are not very specific, which then in the next second, the next sentence, they use another bunch of words to be able to introduce the, the specific thing. And by the time they're done, they've blown through a long paragraph and they've basically only said a few things. I mean, what I try and do is take all of that and just distill it down to these, these essential nuggets that people could read. Perhaps part of it is because of people's attention spans today are because of Twitter and all this stuff um, are very small. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to appeal to that crowd. But I do understand, though, that it, you can't fucking waste words anymore if people are reading shit. And it's the same goes for me. My attention span is not what it used to be because of the Internet and because of the technology and everything. And I'm not sure that's such a bad thing because you should be able, as a writer, in very, very few words, decide what is the essential and how quickly and fast and the minimum amount of words to express it. That always should have been the idea of writing, you know? 
And if some things didn't need to be said, they could be implied and then blown up in the head of the reader, uh, the sensitive reader would understand. Then you should do that too. I, I think and it's. So I think it's, it's very binary. I, I remember I, what what you're saying is 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 most most writers don't realize. I, I remember when I first tried to start writing papers for Beiser, he called me into his office and I said, "So so what was wrong with what I wrote?" And he said, "You don't have an understanding of the topic." He said, "You don't. You just don't understand. There's there's not one sentence I can pick out. You just didn't understand." And and then later on, he helped me figure out what, what I needed to do to understand something. I think your observation is that if you understand something, it writes itself. Most people don't understand something, so they have to write all kinds of shit and it never gets the reader anywhere. Well, look, I could, I could send you, I could send you three pages of, uh, false starts and bullshit in bullshit first sentences and failed first paragraphs, um, before that introduction was written. And I mean, Stuff, I, I, I literally thought that I was unable to write uh, for three days. For three days, I suffered just to get the start of that introduction. And I was slamming my head against the wall in this apartment thinking, I only have you told me a that. limited amount of time. That was three days ago, I right? Have a, yeah, it was a few days ago. I, got, I only have a limited amount of time yeah. and I'm unable to write this. And I thought to myself, maybe I should shoot myself. Maybe I should just kill myself. If I can't fucking write, then I suck ass and I should just get the fuck out of the way. Uh, because I'm not going to write a bullshit introduction. And in fact, I even thought like a cop-out, like, well, I've got this nice forward that I've translated from Hampson. Maybe I'll just use that as the introduction. And I won't write anything at all. And then I felt like a pussy. And I said, God damn it, Dahlstrand. You got to write the fucking introduction. Get to work. And so I suffered. You know, I was, that was one of the reasons I had to go out and buy a uh, beer. Um, I, I, I pledged a no, I made an alcohol pledge to begin the year. And I was, I was keeping to it. And uh, I was suffering, though, and I thought, you know what? Maybe a little alcohol would loosen me up. Maybe that could give me a new perspective. You know, to make art, to, to write, to do it, you can do whatever the fuck you want to do to get it going. You have to. Everything is open. Uh, all options are on the table. You cannot hesitate. If you've got to kill somebody to get the thing written, you've got to fucking kill somebody then, motherfucker. I am I mean, hard at work on translators' intro to poems. It goes slowly. I am a wild pig grunting, pushing stupidly through the heavy brush. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was that was when I that was when I was just getting going. I, I finally felt like I was just getting somewhere. But prior to that, I was, I, I, I thought I was an idiot. I thought perhaps I was I was thinking to myself, maybe truck driving has ruined me. Maybe I'll never write again. I mean, these are the doubts you go through, man. I mean, but they're very. I don't mean to belittle these doubts this time now that I've written this fucking brilliant introduction. But a few days ago, I thought I was an idiot and I was ready for suicide. This I is mean, this is but, like the, the this is like the Foreman Ali fight where uh, Ali was described as being a, a person in a in a bus fire trying to uh, stick his head out the window to survive. The way he was pushed up against the ropes by George Foreman, and then suddenly, I don't know what round it was, like the eighth. Eight, round eight, he just fucking uppercut right hooks George Foreman, and George Foreman like he his life was changed by that event. I mean, this was this was a fucking knockout, and it's interesting that um, the context was that you you had thought you were incapable from a, a career of manual labor, and uh, and then you were struggling, and you felt like you weren't capable of, of, of coming close to, to what you had expected. Um, I, I wonder if it's always that way for people who are look, creating it, something it, new. Look, for, for, lesser, for lesser translators and their lesser translators' introductions, they can pull off some regular bullshit, get their tenure and get their paychecks and uh, feed their families, and they feel all good and everything about it. But the shit I'm trying to write, I want it to last forever. I want people to say that was a goddamn good introduction. I want people to have that response because I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to communicate the things that have made some, you know, have been special to me. And I know I, I have a vision of where it should be. And that's the difference between me and the academics. The academics have no vision. They have a vision of a paycheck. And so I'm writing for something else, you know. Uh, and so it's very, very hard. It's very, very hard when you don't even really know exactly what you're writing for. You know. You have an idea about what's going to cut it, but I mean, you, 
you know that it has to be at a certain level and you're not sure substantially and specifically what that what is going to take to get to that level you know i never wrote an introduction before but i know i didn't i've read i mean you and i have both read thousands of fucking introductions and liner notes to jazz albums and you know whatever the only introduction is I've, someone I've, else's I've, art the only introduction i think uh maybe maybe some shit Beiser wrote but uh, the only introduction that's ever affected me was the introduction to John Shade's poems. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's just part of the whole art, though, uh, from uh, Nabokov. Uh, that's the introduction and the poems and everything was, was the whole art. It's, I mean, but yeah, but that's true, though. I mean, if that was a great introduction, why was that a great introduction? And, uh, you know, why did you want to read these poems? And then why did you want to go into this the, world? The translator to has to be just as interesting as the writer being translated. Well, there you go. It's true. And most translators are shit. Most translators are uh, are, are just stupid fucks with a degree and trying to get tenure with a with a with a new uh, with a new book that's not really even theirs. I mean, translating is kind of an easy way out. Um, what a, betra- I, I what a betrayal didn't... most people would experience if they realized that everything they have been reading their whole lives that has not been written in their original language is an absolute fraud. I mean, I think you find that when um, I even read um, a very bad book. Um, there's an author, Paulo Coelho. He's very popular. He's a... Yeah, yeah, I know his name. He's basically a, a self-help book writer, um, but... He, he, is he? I thought he was a novelist. Yeah, well, they call his books novelists, but I mean, it's 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 mostly just um, mis misguided women in their in their twenties who who think that they've discovered literature and they read this international writer. But if you read his work in the original Portuguese, um, and then you read the English translations, they're they're terrible translations into English. Um, but all the more important, the original Portuguese is 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 absolute dross. It's his his he's not a novelist. He's He's a journalist at best. Um, but the uh, so Hampson wrote travelogues as well in, in his journeys. Did he write? Did he? Uh, no, he wrote he wrote uh, one travelogue about uh, a journey through uh, Russia and Finland and um, I guess like parts of Siberia. I've never read it, um, but he, he did write that. that is all, it, I mean, is it extant? All... I mean, can, can you find it? Yeah, it's called... Um, in a in a wonderful land or in a wondrous land or in wonderland something like that it's 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 been translated and i think the translation's not bad i just haven't read it uh but it it comes during this period that um this period of his first marriage and his debauchery and his you know all these things happening to him um did did he tra- really- did he travel while he was married he did. Uh, he was very much separated from his wife during this period. He he just went off on his own, claiming he needed to write, but he was mostly gambling. There actually are incredible stories of his drunkenness. Um, he would drink for like seven weeks at a time in Oslo or Copenhagen. Jesus and, Christ! Um, I mean, like with, with 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 writing, did he have sober periods during the day, or was it literally seven 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 weeks straight of just drinking? At least I have a book of his letters and he describes himself holed up in a hotel, um, looking at the blank page and just screaming and then writhing on the floor and curling up like a baby and crying. And, um, <laughs> you know, every time I, every time I hear stories like this, I, I feel a lot better about myself. Um, I, th- I think I'd probably be better off if I, you know, if I didn't drink That's at all. That's why I told you. That's why I told you to read Hunger at that time you were feeling bad. I thought it would help you to feel better about yourself. Instead, it did the opposite. It, 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 you thought I was trying to, uh, to cause you to, to, to end your life or something. No, it's but funny. You, 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 you've helped me out a couple of times uh, when, when I've asked you about if I was doing something too extreme. I, I remember when I was in Alaska um, and, I, and I said, I think I'm drinking too much. And really all I was doing was drinking like a 20-ounce bottle of beer at 11 o'clock at night, but I was doing it maybe day after day and then having to get up super early in the morning. And you said to me, you said, um, I'll mention his name. You said, you said, no, no, Danny Garcia is an alcoholic. And you, and you, you, <laughs> you, you, you use the, you, you, you elongated the pronunciation or the enunciation of the word. He said, he's an alcoholic. He drinks all day. 
And, and, then, and then the other thing, and, and, I, and I'm still a very naive person. Many people have told me that I'm very naive and trusting. I don't think I'll ever get over that. But I, I've, I still don't understand. I still don't. I've never seen real, real alcoholics at work, fortunately. Um, although my, my roommate, Camacho, um, after, after you left Alaska, I roomed with Camacho. He would, uh, he would tell me, Jimmy, I think I'm going to get up early and go read or something. And, and no, he was getting up early to go to the liquor store to, to top himself off. But you told me, <laughs> you told me, you said, no, no, Danny, Danny only feels good when he gets his first drink in in the morning. And ne- never in my life, I, I, I've never been able to drink um, in the morning. When I, when I, if I wake up a- after a night of drinking, I want to absolutely detoxify myself. But I never realized that Danny's yeah, you've never, slightly have slurred you, have manner you, of speaking and his, his boisterousness was due to the fact that he was perpetually drunk. He never was sober during the yeah, day. I never realized uh, that. That, that you, must you barely never, be what an alcoholic is. I mean, you've never you've never woken up with a hangover and like drank a beer, just chugged a beer real quick. You feel much better. Um, it steadies you out. You feel good. Uh, that alcohol then it'll level you. So, I mean, there's there's some truth to to being able to drink after a long night of drinking. That just continues the drunkenness actually, and so you never get out of it. You know, like a Bloody Mary. You know, everyone you know is out crazy uh friday or saturday and then they go for brunch and they have a bloody mary or a mimosa um that takes the headache away you feel you feel really good after that uh but i mean danny and all those guys are doing the same thing but i mean there's a flip side to it which is that and and danny and danny was the crane it was the lead crane operator that that was that was also yeah wonderful thing. yeah he's he was the best crane operator i've ever seen best i've ever seen and he was drunk sober drunk as a motherfucker and he wasn't he, he, a bad he, forklift he, driver. He was Danny wasn't a bad forklift driver. Either. No, he wasn't bad. He was he was a good forklift driver too. But his crane operation was I, I don't think you find anyone better. And he could do it cold sober, he could do it fucked out of his mind, he could do it hung over and barely able to see. He he never put anybody down in the hold um, in danger. I mean that, and that is the key of a good uh, a good forklift operator. When you're dropping the bucket down into the hole, the opening that opens up into the hold, that you're aware that the guys are aware that the the bucket's coming down, bucket's coming up, uh, the fish are carefully balanced. Danny Danny was a professional, a very high level professional, as high as level as you're ever going to see, I think, on a crane. Um, the slight, you know, you know the, the, sli- the slightest the slightest mis mallet maladjustment. When you're dropping down a, a, a huge, you kill tote. somebody, or you or you bring the you bring it up too quickly, and the and, and, and I mean you so you rip someone's arm off or crush their hand or fish what is a what is a what is a full what is a full tote way? Full of fish and ice. Oh, what, full of fish and ice and everything. It's probably a thousand pounds, don't you think? I mean, ice. The ice is probably. Well, I'd say oh, the, I'd say the, I'd say oh, the a ice. Tote. Wait, you're talking about a tote. tote. Oh, you're talking about a tote, yeah. not a bucket. Tight tote. Yep. Oh, totes. Totes are a few thousand pounds. They could be up to three thousand pounds. I mean, uh, they're heavy. I heavy mean, there, 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 there wouldn't be. I mean, they they made these guys wear helmets, which was a joke. There, there wouldn't be anything left. If, if well, I, I will tell you, I'll tell you from personal experience, those helmets are a good thing. I got hit with the the bucket, uh, in the head. And I was wearing my helmet, and it it didn't hurt me at all. But the impact knocked me back, and I realized, Jesus, I'm glad I had this helmet on. This this could have this could have really fucked me up. No, no, no doubt the helmets hurt solid. you in, in in minor things like that. Um, you know, it always struck me that the that the fishermen had absolute confidence in the in the crane operators. They got right under the fucking tote. They had no idea that those jaws could break at any any any, any second. We were we were a lot smarter. We never got under that fucking tote. Yeah, but fishermen the fishermen are always tired and they they don't even I mean when you get that tired you almost don't care if you live or die and you're almost excited to see what could happen. Um that's that's the great level of fatigue that most people don't know. It's just, just like I'm so tired and I know this is dangerous, but let's just see where it ha- what 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 happens. Let's just see what happens. Do, now. do you remember when you used to work on the dock before you worked on a boat and that you were in awe of the fishermen they were like 
they were like rock stars. They were like movie stars. They, they were the people that could go out. Well, I tell you what, the, the, the thing that was most impressive about the fishermen was always the, um, you, you knew they were smart. You knew they were, uh, a lot of them had college educations, and that's not to say college educations make you smart, but these were guys that, that could have done something else if they wanted to, and now they were doing, and I, and I say something else, they could have been bankers in New York, they could have done all that shit, which in fact was, was, was stuff that I could have done, and so I felt a camaraderie and a, and a complicity with them, that they were out here too, and they were working hard, and they were doing this stuff. There was something about it that they loved, and I and I totally respected them for that. And that, I mean, and so, you know, when I was in South America and I met, and I met this couple that told me about Alaska, and they had a friend up there, and da da da. da and I'd mentioned Alaska, and I was going to go, and I wanted to go. It just all confirmed for me that that was a place I should be. And when I met the fishermen, and you know, and I loved boats and stuff, it, it it was further confirmation. Alaska is the right place, you know. And so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think that you and I, we came too late. We came too late, you know, and, uh, Alaska's over. I mean, now I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Listen, if I can get enough capital and, or if you can get enough capital, I say we still give it a run to try to catch Peacock or shit. If, if either of us gets wealthy, let's just fucking do the halibut quota, man. Let's go buy some fucking halibut quota and fish that. Yeah. I, let's get a look, boat I'm, with a fucking auto baiter and hire some good deckhands that we trust. Probably some people that maybe worked with some fishing families or some local Alaskan kids maybe from Anchorage who are looking for a challenge. And uh, fucking do it for no, a year or two. I, I think you got to follow, I think you gotta follow the, uh, the program of Carl... And um, the guy on the, the the Sierra Mar, they just take new guys and they give them they give them shitty deals. And, um, and <laughs> wait a second, hard. wait a second. This is not how you want to operate your business after just having described the exploitation of, of of Home Depot workers. I mean, come on. Hey, if you're fishing for peacod, I mean, how are you gonna uh, <laughs> fishing for peacod? How are you ever gonna make any money? How are you gonna justify going out there and doing it? Well, you can you, you know? can uh, you can make you can make some money doing peacod. So peacod on a good day can sell for seventy cents a pound, and you can. Oh my god, it's nowhere near that though. It's nowhere it's nowhere near that though. When they're, I mean, most of the time it's like just above ten cents on the, uh, no on, uh, over there. No much much shit, much shittier fish sells for thirty. I I can only talk about the time I fish, but we got about seventy. And uh, if you catch uh, eight thousand pounds, that's uh, fifty six hundred dollars. Seventy is good though. Seventy is good though. When I got when I got to um, Alaska in February of that, I guess it was 20, 2014. Yeah, twenty fourteen uh, for peacod season. Peacod was just around ten cents. And so the can it did, it wasn't worth it for the cannery to open and process it at that price, and so they it just it just went up a little bit, a couple cents, and so it was like I think it was break even for Charles to be able to process peacod, but he knew that he needed to pay the workers that were there, and so they opened the cannery and they were running it. Um, I was getting that's, I was that's getting paid I went. was getting paid um, I was I I got paid uh, I remember one one good trip for peacod. For three and a half days of work, got paid seven hundred dollars. That's not bad. No, it wasn't bad at all. Um, and, and I that was Peacod. That was Peacod. Yeah, yeah. We we had some we had some we had some pretty good luck with Peacod. Um, just caught a lot of it. We were we were the only ones out there fishing it. It was after Carl had you know fished all the his uh, hal- halibut quota. quota. Yeah, and he, and he also fished Sayas quota. Um. I, I told you the story about the 220 pound halibut that I almost let go into the ocean, right? Uh, I don't think so. So I didn't know uh-huh. shit about shit. And one of the things I didn't know about is that you never unclip a gannon until um, the, 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 for a heavy fish, you never unclip the gannon until you've, you've tied down the fish or you've gaffed the fish. Uh, but. <laughs> 
So we caught a 220 pound halibut and this is towards the end of the season where the price of halibut actually doesn't skyrocket, but it's towards the end. It's, it's closer to $8. So, uh, I'm hearing some feedback right now. You, you hearing that feedback? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm making a, I'm over here, uh, brewing up a little coffee. Oh, uh, oh, you're doing an espresso. Ah, uh, you, you have one of those? Do you recognize it? Uh, I have a, uh, uh, traditional espresso machine, the kind that actually the, the water boils uh, traditionally and it shoots through the machine. It's like a, one of those... Uh, uh, you got one of those fancy Italian ones. This is the, uh, no. this is the, Nes- the Nespresso, you know, where they have those little... But we were, we were getting, things. yeah, we were getting, say, $7 a pound for halibut. And so a 220 pound halibut is worth $1,540. And uh, what I learned is that I had the long gaff in the mouth of the halibut and I was bent over the side of the rail. And um, I didn't realize that you have zero arm strength when you're bent over the side of the rail. You can't, you're just doing like a tricep pull. I mean, you could maybe, you could maybe pull 40 or 50 pounds up, but this is, this is 220 pounds. And so I had Carl's 73 year old wife with another gaff. We were trying to uh, pull, pull this halibut up and it was physically impossible because once it's underwater, you have that suction. And uh, we were miraculously able to get the halibut enough out of the water to uh, lasso the tail or, or somehow use a gaff to get the lasso under the water. Yeah, that's how we did it, to get in the underside of the, of the tail and then, and then winch up the, uh, the halibut, the, the $1,500 bill that was in the water into the boat. And uh, Car- Carl was, was, uh, was swearing at me in Finnish. Um, fortunately he was, Car- Carl was a, was a great guy and was like a father to me, but, um, when, when, but when he would get angry, um, he would let it unleash and it never bothered me. I had very thick skin and I, and, and he, and he would calm down immediately. Um, and then I remember, so we got, we, be, and with that one fish, we had finished off, uh, Saya's quota. That, that, was a, that was, that was a lot of pounds. And, um, Saya went back into the, um, back into the galley and, she brought out uh, three Marlboro Lights and and put uh, put the Marlboro Lights in our mouths because we were we were pulling and so we were soaking wet and in slime, and that was one yeah. of the greatest treats. Um, Saya used to just put cigarettes in our mouth, and you and and, you, and just and you just you'd inhale that cigarette in like three or four drags. The fi- they they their 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 finished term for cigarettes was was ciggy butts, and uh, ciggy butts. He'd always say he'd always say mama. Not not like you call the lot, the lot lizards, but but it's a it's a term of affection for your wife. You say, "Mama, let's have a ciggy butt," and and Saya would uh would come out and, and feed us. But um, so he um he wrote about uh t- returning to ha- uh, Hansen. He wrote about Islam and, and, and Christianity. What was his uh, what was the motivation to do that? Because I mean, now uh, I suppose there. Well, that was just that was just one poem. That that. That's sort of an inconsequential poem. Uh, he, I mean, he, obvi- obviously because he was so desperate and uh, near ready to shoot himself and living on the edge all the time, he certainly had very various interests in different religions. He was he was never a Christian. He was never a Buddhist. He was never anything. Uh, but he he certainly was open to to exploring some of these ideas from, from different religions to, I mean, I mean, he was looking for peace, you know, the goddamn God was looking for peace, man. His life was all upheaval all the time. What was his, uh, what were the religion, and, uh, what, what, what is the religious background of these Norwegians? Do they have any of this, um, pre, I think pre, Lutheran. pre-Christian paganism? Lutheran. Okay. So, so, no, so. I, I think Lutheran, I, I, he, he didn't come from one of those, um, Lapland, uh, tribes or anything like that. Uh, although he was familiar with these Laps, um, who were pagans up there in the north? So he was familiar with all of that, and uh, I mean th- those those elements do appear in his books as well as the poetry uh, that I've translated. But uh, Nirvana appears and Muslim stuff appears. I mean he's open to all of it, but he's also critical of it because he doesn't he doesn't really believe in anything at all, you know. And the end. He never just, he never he never found peace. Well, I mean, he just wanted to get his work done. I think he was happiest when he was working well, and um, it 
you know, not being disturbed. Was was that the only time that he got his shit together and he stopped drinking? Well, he was he was a man of discipline. So even if he was drinking for seven weeks um, at a time, he could still sit down and get his work done. I mean, he he still got his shit done after all, even though he was, you know, spending all his money and wasting everything and destroying everything. And they you know, they he, they described he'd they, find a way out. They described uh, he'd find a way F- out. Fitzgerald and Faulkner. I, I know you don't like Faulkner. I actually like him a lot. No, I like Faulkner. I like Faulkner. Okay, but. Both both of those guys uh, were 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 big drinkers and and much much bigger drinkers than I've ever been. Uh, they're probably 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 more akin to Danny Garcia and Camacho, but um, unlike me, they've, these guys have done an incredible amount of of, of work. Um, Faulkner's books are very very long, and uh, and he was he was a drunk. I don't know. I think some of the I think some of these guys would just take take a break. Yeah, but I mean some some of those some of those books he's got sentences that go for fifteen pages. Only a drunk could could fucking write a sentence for fifteen pages. <laughs> just not shut it down. Ker- you know? Ker- Kerouac, who's probably not. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if if, if you think he's a literary genius. Well, yeah, but he, he he would fucking tape, tape together. Ben's dream. Ben's dream. He had to just just get a huge roll of uh, paper so he could just type for 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 forty five hours. So, do you know that I mean, the uh, the Lilly Library um, at Indiana University, Lilly is the name of a pharmaceutical company based in Indianapolis, but one of the um, founders, one of the wives of the founders, donated millions of dollars to this extraordinary uh, archive library that has many of the letters of Charles Olson that I've seen in person, uh, many original uh issues of the of of Olson's books you remember um Olson used to this whatever press they they used to issue covers that had um felt and uh velvet and different different materials but in any case um they they have the original Kerouac manuscript of On the Road that he had taped together he had he would tape hundreds of pages uh like a old printer reel so his typewriter, he would never have to put in a new, uh, a new piece of paper. You had told me about this, and then I had finally seen it in person. Well, from what I understand, it that's not the one that was actually published, uh, but it was one of the versions that he did. Mm-hmm. I mean, Kerouac, Kerouac's a guy out of uh, out of the whole beatnik thing. I mean, when I was sixteen and fifteen, I got into all that, and and I was influenced by it. I, I and I still am in a way. Because these guys, he, these guys he's, went he's out a badass. I mean, Ker- Kerouac was a badass. I mean, whether they lived their lives. whether he was a good writer is kind of irrelevant. He was doing some really cool shit. That, I mean, that was the thing. These guys went out into the world, and the literature was not something they got from an MFA program or a, a research library. That wasn't where stories were. Stories were their own lives. And those that life was going to happen out where people were working, whether it was working on a train or traveling or taking drugs. I mean, I, I don't really like the, I don't think the whole drug taking thing, but that's because time has shown that drug taking doesn't really produce great results. But at the time, to take drugs was pretty pretty revolutionary, you know, to change your change your perceptions and stuff. So it was it was worthwhile to explore that, and those guys did. I mean, but that was a risk. I mean, they were risking prison sentences. And like one one uh, one joint of marijuana put you away for like ten years in San Quentin. I mean, it was it's pretty serious stuff. So these guys have balls, you know. I mean, all the guys in the past have balls. No one's got any balls anymore. That's part of the problem. Hampson uh, Hampson was accused of being a dissolute seducer and idler. <laughs> yeah. Now now. <laughs> He was a desolate. He was accused of being a desolate seducer of married women, and idol. Idolate- There's more to that story. There's more to that story, though. Um, he, well, when when this poison pen letter campaign began against that, that him was topic. That was my next topic, wife, by the way. I'm so glad you broached it. Please, please, I, I, I'm dying. But when to that hear began about against him, when that began, like he'd been stalked by this woman for at this point, like six or seven years now. Um, and then this poison pen campaign began with letters going to everyone, everyone in his family, everyone in her family. And the interesting thing, I didn't really get into a whole lot, but the interesting thing that happened was is that the police 
Uh, well, actually, two things. The first thing was is that Anna Munch, the woman who was writing the letters, then published a novel. And the novel was written in the first person about her stalking a famous author and writing letters to destroy his life. So she wrote the novel of everything that was happening. So the police, when they came to her, said, are you writing these letters and da 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 da? And she said, how could I possibly be the writer of these letters? I've just written and published a novel about this exact situation. Clearly, this is all a fabrication of Hamson, you know? And she said, Hamson, the one who's written this crazy book called Hunger, this other wild book called Mysteries, with these unreliable and wild protagonists who kill themselves and chew on their own thumbs and create new words and are crazy. Obviously, it's Hampson's creation. And the police were convinced of this explanation to believe that Anna Munch was not the writer. And in fact, the blame pointed to Hampson. And so Hampson, after all of this, now felt that he was being investigated. They were taking uh, writing samples from him and from everyone and comparing them. Nor- Norwegian Hampson, investigators. You don't want to. You don't want to get mixed yes. up with a bunch of fucking Norwegian eventually, investigators. Eventually, Hampson had enough, and he appealed to the Prime Minister of Norway to end the investigation, begging him to end the investigation. <laughs> it's just hilarious. Po- so, just, uh, I mean, mean, talk talk more about what what is a poison pen letter? What what is somebody trying to get at? What what is the purpose? Well, she was writing these anonymous uh, letters saying, "Beware, Hamson. He had sex with me. He took all my money and left me." She would write that to uh, his 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 fiance, to her father. She would write something in the guise of someone else, saying, "My daughter was manipulated and 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 ruined by this man who just is after um, the family's money." And I mean, that's she was a, she was a creative stalker, you know, and she she was. She was uh, diligent. I mean, she'd been at it for a number of years. And with Hampson's impending marriage, this drove her to, uh, did, did she to do it? try and sabotage it. Did him. she do it out of, um, out of, out of mere, mere entertainment? Or did, did she feel slighted? Did, did, did Hampson refuse her, her, not, her advances? Or did, did she? Yeah, well, he, Ham, there are letters. There are letters about that. Hampson, there's a great letter where he describes her as a as a red faced hippopotamus, <laughs> a red faced hippopotamus, and he tells the police, "I could never have sex with that woman. Look at her; she's a red faced hippopotamus." <laughs> oh. So, the, but, so, the, uh, so, the, so, 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 it was it was a woman who was slighted. Um, a red be, well, beware of the red faced a, hippopotamus. Did he write a poem on with a, that title? On a on account, on account of such books as uh, Hunger and Mysteries, she became attracted to Hampson. The, I mean, these were books with... Um, generally, you have to read both of these books. They're, they're extraordinary. This um, strange behavior of... I mean, just, just bizarre, bizarre stuff. Um, but this drew these bizarre people to Hampson. And he just sort of tolerated it. I mean, he had tolerated this woman for years. This woman followed him on, on all of his travels. She would book herself into every guest house that he booked himself into. She would show up at every cafe that he was in. She would try and meet him for dinner. She she was everywhere that he went. She, whether it was in she, Paris. Would, she would try to meet him for dinner, but but not not in some coordinated invitation. She would no. She would she, she showed would try up to everywhere. Sit, sit sit down next to him when he was eating dinner and, and, and eat with him. She was everywhere. She was. For, this went on for years and years. But Hampson was sort of the kind of guy who was like, ah, it's very strange. He just accepted it. He just accepted it. Until, of course, it began to affect um, his, his relationship with his fiance, and that he felt pre- – I mean, this just, this just caused such turmoil uh, in these years. Um, it was very damaging. It was very damaging. It was, the, it was the only period in his life in which he really struggled to write. Um, this, this rem- and that his drinking was intense. There, there are some incredible drinking stories. Uh, one in which he, um, he was sitting with a friend in a bar, and a, and a farmer went by with a, with a, with a bunch of hay pulled by uh, like some horses, and he ran out of the bar and he said, "Let me buy your hay and buy your horses." 
And the guy said, okay. And he offered some exorbitant sum. Hemsen would always just, you know, just ridiculous sums of money for things. Didn't matter. I mean, the whole point was to make things happen. And so he bought this, uh, this big hay cart and horses. And then he, he bought all this alcohol and he and his friends jump on and they just drank around in the hay cart. And then his friends all fell asleep and passed out, but he wanted to keep drinking. And he ran into the farmer again who was walking home. He just gave him the hay cart and his horses and said, oh, you just have it back and gave it to him and let the guy go home. And uh, after, after just, having paid the guy this this extraordinary oh he of paid money. him just an exorbitant amount of money for it and they just gave it to him basically and let a him short it term then. rental but 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 it would have been in excess of the of the very purchase price but he he just wanted oh, to yeah yeah use it for but a moment. I mean there 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 are a lot of really incredible st- I I mean it it might have these these stories might have made the introduction better but it it, it would start verging on the uh, on the point of just like producing ridiculous stuff uh, and detracting from the poems themselves. Because they're they're just there, there's there was just extraordinary stuff happening. And uh, look, I mean, the the point is, is he's a great guy. I, I I've I've been stupid. I've been prone to the same sort of behavior, and the the, the things he expresses, I, I felt the same things. So I mean, what I what period of your life do you feel that was the closest to his period of dissolution, dissipation, and and self destructive behavior? Well, I mean, um. I'm, I feel that I'm always just uh, perhaps a few hours away from that behavior. <laughs> that behavior is never far away. I mean, even when I, even when you think you're 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 immune to it, uh, it could and, and on a flip of a switch, it could be there again. I mean, I mean, when all is permitted, when you when you when you really are fucking serious about living, and you permit yourself to engage in any sort of situation, and worse than that, if you realize something is possible. Uh, and you know that turning away from what is possible would be an act of cowardice. And you tell yourself that you're a fucking coward. You're a fucking coward if you don't do it. Well, at that moment, then you're capable of anything. You're going to push yourself into something. You know, the, the, the philosopher Socrates, I guess he's not a philosopher. He's just a guy. But anyway, he talked about something called the daimon. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. It's a Greek word. D i. D a i d a i m o n. Is it some spirit in 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 in, in English? Yeah. But it, it it's a word that is like um it's like a call it's like an inner calling, and it's something that is not really a part of you. It's something divine in some sense, and Socrates always had it. I mean, it was why he didn't hesitate to take hemlock and end his life. It is why he would have no problem asking, um very insulting and um, dangerous questions to the king of, of, of some country. or I mean, he would have no hesitation or any of this. It was because of this inner voice that called out. And I think in many ways, I, I have that same inner voice. I think Hampson had that inner voice. I, you know, I don't think everyone has that inner voice. And, and I don't think you're a coward uh, if you don't respond to it or anything like that. But certain people feel that they always must respond to the inner voice, whether it means... Um, drinking the hemlock or it means um, uh, buying uh, some farmer's hay cart when you're drunk or it means uh, having to travel to Patagonia or it, I mean, it could mean any of these things. But the idea is though that that when that voice calls out, uh, you must respond to it. And it, it, the threat is serious. It's not just that you'd be branded a coward. It's just that your life would be somehow diminished and you'd have to live a diminished life because you had shied away from the call of that voice. That's the diamond of Socrates. And the, I think in all men, there's some level of a diamond uh, and, and, or a daemon. And, 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 and this diamond, however it's pronounced, I mean, it, it seems to be the, the, the commonality with, with all of these, uh, these geniuses is that very few of them have been able to have normal lives, have been able to really... Uh, provide for themselves or, or they've been self-destructive. And I mean, he, he was, he was rejected by, it seemed he, he was kind of rejected by the, the writing class of the time. Or was he? He was finally accepted. He was finally accepted. Um, and he, he became very wealthy. Of course, the Nazism uh, destroyed all that and they took all his money and he died in shame. Well, not, he was never shameful of what he did, um, but he died uh, in poverty, like I said, blind and wrapped in newspapers, shivering in a in a in, in his in his little home. Uh, yeah, but I mean, 
I mean, he, I think he was always happy in a way because he know he 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 knows that he'd done great work. I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, the call of the diamond is the call to do great work he, and to to live in a great way. He uh, and he uh, had an experience. Not all men, mm-hmm. but he he had an experience, um, may, maybe similar to to, to to your experience by go, going out in the wilderness when you went out and you were in this 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 windswept terrain on the. Uh, the west coast of uh, Argentina, he was uh, in the fjords, and um, he wrote about islands and, and 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 pantheism. What 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 do you when you say that he he had a he wrote about pantheism? Did he have some religious experience about how nature was somehow a solution, somehow of a cathartic process to help him come to peace or to focus or to understand himself? Do you think he was well, happiest living pan, in this pan, in this earth and hut? Pantheism, the pantheism is is a word that I oh, I don't know if that's going to survive uh, in the published version of that introduction, just because it it seems to it seems to be very strong religiously, um, and as I said before, Hampson really was not, and uh, there but there's certainly Hampson loved the forest. He loved the north. He loved to to lay on his back in the forest or in the fields or near the fjords. Um, The natural world, uh, whether it killed him or whether it made him feel alive, it didn't matter. He felt completely, completely comfortable in it. Um, He had this peace that he never had. Uh, So in many ways, this is something I didn't write about in the introduction. And it really deserves sort of a, a deeper perhaps a deeper scholarly article. I don't know if I'll ever write it, but for I think for Hampson, the city is a place of psychology and individualism where you're disturbed and you, and you, and you have all these problems and issues. Um, his, his book, Hunger, is a city book. It's about suffering in the city and being alone. But he never wrote about suffering in the countryside or suffering in the, in the north and suffering in a forest. Because there wasn't suffering. I mean, it, the forest could kill you, but that would never be suffering. This this whole this um, whole take this, on, on on mental illness it, it almost seemed to have arisen out of the the increase in uh, urbanization that has been a very recent phenomena. I almost wonder if the Laplanders that uh, were living in in, in the same uh, the same area that 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 he was uh, doing his most formative work and in, in his, in his in the, the poetic epic of his life, I, I, I almost wonder if, if these Laplanders just didn't even understand the concept of, of mental illness. Well, they, they were soon to understand it because the, the bankers and financiers, uh, the developers, the uh, industrialized farming, the tools necessary to farm to be able to produce uh, things for a market economy and goods at a market economy and a harvest for a market economy um, at low enough prices that could be able to sustain someone uh, that came to the north and that changed Lapland and that changed Nordland. And Hampson was, was to write about that as well um, in, a, in a great book that came much later uh, in 1917 called The Growth of the Soil. Uh, really brilliant. But it has none of the psychological, disturbed, um, city living kind of madness of the early works. Did, did the growth of the it's, soil, um, was it the genesis of your, your writing about surplus or was it something that you were able to identify and appreciate um, a- after you had identified this concept of surplus? Because I think in your philosophical work, um, surplus has been one of your... Well, surplus, eh, surplus came earlier. I mean, that came, I think it came earlier. I, I actually read Growth of the Soil when I was on a fishing boat, the Camelar. Uh, on the uh, on the Bay of Alaska, fishing. I was still reading Growth of the Soil then. That's um, the difference between an well, auto bader boat and a, and a, and a, and a, and a snap on boat is that you can you you can read literature on a auto bader. <laughs> yeah, you got all this leisure time. You got a lot of leisure just sit around reading books. You don't have to work as a fisherman. Yeah, yeah, you're I, right. I, about that. I, I joke. I, I would get up. I would get up um, an hour early. Carl would get up early as well, but uh, I would get up an hour earlier than I needed to get up. Tucker would get up when he heard the diesel engine running, literally just throw on his rain gear and start start fishing immediately. But 
I would write for an hour. Both Carl and Tucker were, they were like tribesmen looking at me. What, what, what is this strange machine that he has? What are, what are all these words that he's typing in uh, to, this, to this machine? But I, would, uh, I, would, I, would, I had time to write in the morning. Um, I'm not sure if an hour a day on my trips would have gotten, well, that's gotten, impressive. gotten through. Yeah, it, it was. It was some of my most um, clear, clear-headed clear thinking uh, in, in my life. I would try and read when I was on, um, I was on drift. I was on drift duty. We'll, you know, we'll or, watch. Yeah. Yeah. I was up there trying to keep myself awake. I'd be reading. But the interesting thing was the translation of, of that book I was reading was a very poor translation. It was in the public domain. And there were some words that were left in Norwegian. And um, fortunately, I had uh, uh, Lars, who is Swedish, who was the, uh, the skipper. And so I'd say, hey, hey Lars, uh, wh- what does uh, this word mean? And he'd say, hmm, yeah, that means this. And because I mean, Swedish and Norwegian very close, especially at that time, um, the Norwegian words that I was talking about. Uh, and then interestingly enough, uh, when, when we finished our trip and we actually flew back to Anchorage, Lars, uh, there was, there was something he wanted to meet his wife in Anchorage and stuff. So we had some time to kill and I, he wanted me to drive his truck back to, uh, to Seward anyway. So he's like, he proposed we go and we watch a movie together and we didn't know anything about movies. And he said, oh, my wife recommended this movie, which was, um, it was about these two young cancer victims. Um, it was a real tearjerker. Real tearjerker. <laughs> cancer victims. They were. Yeah, they were. They were. They were. They were both. They both had cancer, and they were in love, and they were teenagers. Something about something in our stars, or something like that. Anyway, in the movie, it was so funny. I'm sitting there with Lars. We're watching this movie, and we're both trying not to cry because really, it's so sad. I mean, the movie's all made for you to try and cry over and over. I mean, it just I too. Mean, Two, two salty, two salty fishermen, yeah, sitting, we're, sitting we're together, fishermen. holding back tears. Can't cry, but anyway, there's a scene. There's a scene where uh, I think William Defoe is in it, and uh, they go and they meet this guy, and it's strange. William Defoe is playing Swedish rap music, and William Defoe announces to them that there is nobody who understands what the fuck anyone is rapping about in this music. And I remember sitting there next to Lars, who's Swedish, and we're in this middle of Anchorage. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I'm in this movie, this strange movie after all this fishing. And this just been announced in this movie that no one could understand this rap music. And I'm sitting next to this guy who understands all the rap music. This, 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 this skipper, the Swedish skipper. It was, just, it was just so strange. And then Lars gave me the key to his truck. And he's like, yeah, yeah take the truck back to Seward and you know, go back to the cannery. You know, do what you're going to do and just drop the truck off over at the, at the streets. Um, and I was driving back. You know, the, the drive from, from uh, Anchorage to Seward is beautiful. I mean, you've, you've taken that bus ride. See, so you, you know it. You've been on it. Um, just beautiful. I owned a truck for nearly three months in Alaska. I, I, I drove it. Ah, you've driven it. Anyway, I'm driving down the road and I see this like brown form, this large brown form running up the road right at me. I'm like, what the fuck is, what is that? What is, it's a moose. It's one of those huge moose. It's just barreling down the lane right at, my, right at the pickup truck. I swerve out of the way and this moose just goes, just bombing down the road back past me. Uh, just, uh, it's Alaska though, you know, just Alaska, strange stuff. But you know what? And this gets back to what I was telling you earlier uh, is that, this is all the same latitude of that northern part of Norway with Hampson and everything. And, and I don't know, there's this whole latitude from Russia through Canada, through Greenland. Uh, this, this, is, this seems extraordinary. This is something to explore. You know, guys like Hugh Brody and Edmund Carpenter, they were up there. But I've never heard of anyone who did a latitudinal tour um, of the tree line up there. Uh, it, it would... It would be the trip of a lifetime. It really would. You know, I don't. I don't know if I'll have the strength or I'll ever have the mastery to be able to pull it off. How do you? Uh, how do you? Uh, or, or, how do you do it? I mean, what is? Uh, is it? Is it? Is it a hike? Well, you got to have the languages first. The language, as you know, uh, if you don't have the languages, you can't go to a place. You can't, especially a place where that could kill you. You really have to have the languages. So you have to have a new piet to be able to communicate in Alaska with with the Eskimos and Canada with the natives. 
uh, Greenland as well, a new piece. So, is work. Are, are you just open to the, the the manner of actually covering the land based on your you, you meet the culture, you integrate with the culture, you find out if they're walkers, if they're horseback riders, if they're if they're going to drive a uh, an ATV. Yeah, but that, for that's, one that's thing, what you find for, out when you're there. But you don't you don't plan on how you're going to actually yeah, traverse. For one, but I mean, for one thing, the whole idea of traveling the whole latitude is a is a Western idea, is an American idea or European. I mean, none of these people would ever think about leaving their their hunting grounds or their area. I mean, it's just ridiculous to them. So um, to go where their their words didn't work anymore this, would be th- ridiculous. This is something that you I you've mean, written about extensively. Um, it's actually one of the more profound elements of your philosophical work. You um, have written about why. The, the Western tendency to, to travel and to seek is, um, is something that would be very upsetting and counterintuitive for, for happy people, for people that have a... Well, part, part, of it is, part of it is, though, is that we seem to believe that we have the language for places that we've never been, that we can talk about places we've never been. And if you could talk about a place, you feel like you could, you're familiar with it, you can go there. Um, we, we, we speak in these abstractions. We speak of the globe and globalism. We no longer have a very local language. It's a very general and abstract one, which is a false sense of security. It makes us think that we can, we can go live in, in, in some place we've never been before. We know nothing about. But you take like a Nupiat Eskimo whose words are particularly attuned to only his location and hunting ground and everything. I mean, he realizes that the, the edge of his world is the edge of his language. To go beyond that, he could he could say nothing about it and not and know nothing about it. Why would he ever want to go there? I mean, there's just no interest. I mean, it would be the arrogance, it would be bizarre. It would be scary. The, the arrogance of this of this perspective is embodied in the map, and 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 even more so in the road. Um, the road obviously erases um, the last traces of the natural formation of the of the topography. And then obviously it is an element that introduces uh, our, our so-called development in, in civilization. But the map doesn't account for the meaning of the experience of, of those who have actually lived on that land. Even, even a topographical map doesn't account for the meaning of having arrived and moved through and, 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 and having lived and created a life there and hunted there. And you remember, you, you remember in um, that... Uh, that Alaska book of Edmund Carpenter, he asked uh, hunters to draw a map of of their hunting land or the coast or things like that, and they would draw these maps um, of places they hunt. And, and it and it was artwork. It was it was a phenomenology of the meaning of their experience of the land. It was not a guide. It, More than that, a Carpenter produced pa- Carpenter produced a. Um, I guess he got a satellite picture or overhead picture of the same area or a map a map uh, an actual map of those areas it was nearly identical to what the hunters had drawn the hunters had the map of these areas as they 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 knew them from the ground as these westerners know it from the air or these westerners know it with their their compasses and their their diagrams and their their measurement instruments these guys knew it i mean it's just it's just so the, extraordinary. The, Ca- and so Ca- Carpenter writes about in blinding snowstorms. I believe he actually was with the Inuit when this happened. But in a blinding snowstorm, imagine the wind of Patagonia, but but complicated further with the with the blinding um, fog of snow. They would be on these uh, the edges of the coast, rocky coasts, uh, ice covered, and they would still be able to follow the contour of the coast by sliding on their butts using their hands right. and feeling feeling the snow and the way that the, the 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 winds they actually could feel the way the winds had sculpted the snow and were able to identify where they were by the by the by the sculpting of the snow on their ass uh, yeah i mean we're we're impressed by that but i i suppose at the same time those same people are impressed that we can walk down a street of Manhattan and know where we're going and be able to locate ourselves and have general direction. I mean, we have, we have other visual cues which we're using, which they are unaware of, and they don't use. They, in a city environment, most of those people are lost. 
Uh, whereas we're, we're just fine. You could drop us in any city anywhere and we would kind of be able to figure out where we are. These, 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 these Eskimo Inuit people, at least of that time, um, were lost in cities or even in places where there was no wild cue to, to direct them. When there were only man-made cues, uh, they couldn't understand those cues. So it's just kind of the opposite of us. But, you know, the interesting thing, though, is that the whole idea of the language, I, I keep getting back to the language. I just feel is that our language has, is being um, stripped of its local, of its local um, dialects and its local uh, definitions. And when I say local, I mean communities of, of small groups of people and families and things and expressions that are very, very particular to a certain place and time. The, so Hampson had uh, spent some time on this fjord. I mean, his, his country was surrounded by water. Is, is there something about the Scandinavian writers that is very special because of their, their access to an open sea? The sea is, is, the mo- is most of the earth. We always forget about that. I think only the fishermen realize the actual expanse of, of, of the earth. But, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're living in an earthen hut and you're looking out to the sea— and you're away from the city, is is that the secret? I mean, that that the sea, uh, other than looking to the sky and the stars, I mean, is was was that something that that motivated him or influenced him or that transformed his work after he left the city? Well, uh, that that natural world of the north, that the Northland and all its forests and all of that, uh, was hugely hugely important to him. I, these these poems signal his return. The, the forest, to that, but to not necessarily world. the sea, though. The sea as well, the the fjords and the sea and uh, all of that. I mean, he, he in these poems he writes about the fishermen uh, returning, and uh, I, I, you'll have to you'll have to read you have to read the poems. There's some there's some very beautiful so ones. But you uh, you and I have experienced um, the very hospitable portion of Alaska. Alaska is very big. Isn't Alaska relative to the United States? How big is Alaska? Uh, it's huge. It's huge. It's like uh, what's it like three times the size of Texas or something? It's a big. It's oh, a. It's a big. Eight. It's a big fucking place. But the uh, the great thing about the Kenai is you've got glaciers, you've got mountains, you've got forest, you've got ocean, but it becomes more severe. Um, not not unlike getting to the uh, end of the earth in Tierra del Fuego, you pass through very severe tundra, beautiful, but really, really a terrain that is, is unplantable in terms of agriculture. A lot of the water is saline, beautiful moss formations of which that you really can't eat. Uh, perhaps some, perhaps some moose moose in the in, in the tundra areas, but um, not not a whole lot of edible. Um, plants or animals and then you get to the north where if you don't know how to hunt walrus or whale you uh or seal you you really will die and you will starve so you go i mean this is truly the the pure hunter society and i wouldn't even call it hunter gathering because there there isn't any fruit or vegetation there's a there's an absolute dearth of wood um you you will recall in, in 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 reading um Brody and Carpenter that uh, wood was a very prized possession. It was um, used for for their artwork. In addition to um, yeah, they thought they thought wood came from the bottom of the sea or something, didn't they? Something it was like it was it was very rare, and uh, so it was very very special. Well, they didn't they, they they had no idea about trees, so they assumed that this thing came from the bottom of the sea and would wash up on the shore or something. It was something like what, that. What what would the, what would they do after they would carve something of value to them or 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 spend their their time um perhaps um making a representation of a helping or hurting spirit what would they do with this artwork i mean would they would they carry it with them would they preserve it what would they do no you you know you know what they did they they left it they left everything behind at their camps the camps um even from thousands of years ago the camps are just littered with um carvings that they'd done while they were presumably sitting there and eating and feasting from a good hunt someone would pick up a piece of bone and release 
release the animal or release something that was hidden in the bone. So in, in I mean, your... the interesting thing is, is that the artist, the act of artistic creation was never an individual act. Everyone had the capability of, 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 of seeing and summoning and speaking and making poetry and carving. And the idea was just that these things were all there. They just needed to be released. You know, the word for poetry is the same as the word for breath um, in Inupiat. So it's, it's, it's just the same as breathing. You know, it kind of, it kind of reminds me of the, you know, it, all throughout Alaska and Northern America, the Indian words for medicine are the same as the words for meat. You know, to have good meat is to have good medicine. And the medicine man and, and, the, and the meat and all the hunt and all this stuff comes together. I mean, we just have such limits of language and our language has just been so damaged and perhaps changed by marketers and corporate people and city people and all of that, that we're, we're just not in tune with, with words that would, would allow us to live in a very, very particular place at a very particular time. How would you come to understand? Our yeah. How, how would you compare your first bicycle tour um, where you were rarely journaling? You certainly didn't have a smartphone. You didn't have a laptop. You weren't taking photographs. Were you similarly just, discarding your experiences every every day i mean and, 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 no, i i think you're talking about when i was when i was traveling in 1998 i i, I rode from budapest to pampelona for the feria of san fermin to run with the bulls and uh i wrote i wrote the whole time and i just as i wrote when we were traveling together the year previous and i sent all of those journals to uh my girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, she gave those journals back to me years later. And then stupidly, I left all those journals in France when I left France. And so they were in a box. And I think they may still be in a box somewhere in France um, with the mother of my ex-wife, um, perhaps in the north of France, in Epinal. Uh, I don't know. It could be lost. The, re- the, 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 lost. The, the, the refugees have obviously put, put that into the fire. I, I, I'm, I'm deadly curious about the longing of an aging virgin. <laughs> the poem is called The Old Spinster. It's a good, it's a, it's a good poem. It's a good poem. Uh, I mean, this, this, this guy, I mean, there, there were no ends to his curiosity. He, he got in the mind of... Uh, of an old spinster. I, I wonder what was the context of that? How did he encounter this old spinster? Yeah, I don't know that, that I don't know. I can't, I can't tell you about how he knew about the old spinster, but, uh, I think you're, I think you're right though, is that he probably must've had some sort of encounter because Hampson, Hampson didn't really write about stuff he didn't know about. If, I mean, although he, he did sometimes, what was, uh, what was, he would imagine things. He would imagine things strange if he didn't know about something he would just make up just make up shit that was just ridiculous uh but it's fun it's fun to read what i mean he just makes up a lot of ridiculous you, stuff you sometimes. you in, in 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 the translator's introduction by the way where is is there any aspect of the translator's introduction in which the translator um uh provides gratitude to those who helped him in the process of translation is there is there any well i was uh, I was gonna, I was gonna do something like that, but um, since nobody helped, have you, fact, have, have, you have you written, have you written anything about that? Can you, can you share that? No. Uh, well, I can share the first few lines of it. I don't know if I'll use this. I actually have, I actually have written something. Um, this, this would go at the end of a translator's note, which I already prepared, but this may or may not be included. Since you're curious, I'll, men- I'll, I'll read the first few lines of it. While it has become customary for translators to list those individuals who in a professional or personal capacity assisted them in their translation, I can provide no such list. The bulk of this translation was completed in the sleeper of a big rig truck at truck stops and rest areas across the continental United States. It is more fitting, and I was going to go on to, to speak of the Speak of the, all of the elements that, that made the, this translation difficult, and it took me longer than probable than I probably needed to complete it had I had good situations. I, I, you you, know, you need to really I, I, my, my, my vote is that this is, this is a huge part of the introduction. 
I don't know if it comes at the end or at the beginning. Um, maybe in the middle. Uh, nah, I have a I have a translator's note that talks about the text itself, and I think I'll just stick it on the back of that. Uh, it'll 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 make a fitting end to that translator's he, note. He he and uh, very exciting for the reader that the reader. All the all the academic readers will read it and say, "Oh, yeah, I mean, this guy's not a real translator, so we can shit on his book, and we can say we can shit on his book, and we know we're not going to have any repercussions because he's just a truck driver. He doesn't have a PhD, and he he's not tenured somewhere, so we can shit on him without the fear that he's going to have retribution somehow. Uh, that no doubt that'll be the response. These these fuckers are petty." these petty academic well people. i i mean then 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 i think the 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 obvious response is you have to go on a lecture tour and you have to directly attack these people and they have to sit in the front row no i'm gonna go on a lecture tour with a tire iron <laughs> he uh he wrote a poem about feminism uh i, yeah. I, I learned this from uh my, my my reading of the translator's introduction what what was that? Well, what did it mean? There's, there's a very there, that's that's a famous poem, and it's still made, it's still as famous because. Uh, is it a long? Is it a long poem? You know, uh, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty lengthy, but the beginning. Can, can you can you read it? The beginning um, addresses some of these feminist things. And, can can, uh, can you read the poem? I, I mean, do you have it? Do you have it available? I can read a few. I can read a few lines of the beginning because I think I think they could be instructive for. Um, for what? What? Uh, yeah. Well, the, the the poem is called "Letter to Byron in Heaven." Um, the literal translation of it is, I guess, people used to write these heavenly letters, and that meant like you'd write a letter to someone who was Byron dead. is a reference to Lord Lord Byron. Lord Lord Byron, the poet. Um, and uh, Lord Byron, he's kind of an interesting guy, you know. He was, uh, you know a womanizer and a, and a fighter and he went to Greece and fought. I mean, he did, all, he did a lot of shit, wrote some poetry and people hated him and loved him. Um, one of these romantic guys. Uh, but I mean, took risks, you know, kind of a badass. A and he had a club foot. Um, so to overcome a club foot and still have that confidence. <laughs> Wait, well, what is, uh, Very impressive. What, is, what is a club foot? I think I kind of know what it is, but. He was born lame, lame, lame. you know. Here, well, l listen to this. Listen to this. Uh, I'll, I'll just re I'll just read the beginning of this. Letter to Byron in heaven. Come back now, night. The time is ripe. Befouled are our lives by working class rabble, by the peace lovers' tripe, by feminist prattle. Under the state's protection, men lays about and gripe. Who in our time takes pride in themselves and flaunts it? The slave drivers and heroic explorers once had passion, but now stamp collectors are in fashion, and every slobbering old poet. In your time, having spirit was not a cliché. Even the heroes of Yeren would be ridiculed today, like the kings and emperors are laughed at. Back then you stood on the raised deck of your galley, and with your sword high the soldiers you did rally. And that sword was held shining by an arm that did not yield, with a courage abiding, a simple faith you did wield, and there in greatness you were revealed. Today our poets proceed with much care, looking to make friends to the theater they come, and while heaven blesses them with an income, it is only with children they have any fanfare. In tolerance and progress there is none like Byron, expressing himself beyond every limit of caution. He writes, he burns, he smolders, and stews against the Turks on behalf of Armenia's Jews, yeah, it goes on and on. It goes on and on. It's Jesus fucking Christ! I that that I, I'm I'm I, I, my my reaction is is this not your writing? What the fuck? This was written when? Uh, eighteen nineties. This is this is you know? this shit. I mean, blows the fucking hair back. My fucking god. Yeah, but it, but you, but you realize though he he had you know Hampson had just read Nietzsche. I mean, this is, these are all, you know, Bicer's time and the guys Bicer's writing about. Hampson is a contemporary. So um, 
the, these ideas are in the air. There's there's a reaction against um, indust- the early industrialization of the world, against democracy, progress. People are p- these early philosophers are questioning this new thing, and they're they're seeing it. They're they're viewing it from the kind of uh, a pessimistic view instead of an optimistic view. I mean, this is this era is the emergence of pessimism, where the first time since the Enlightenment, m- you know, men are pessimistic about the future and say. May wait, 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 wait a second, wait a second. This this may not be good. The, this whole idea of progress, which you support, may not be going towards something that's better, but for something that's very, very worse. Uh, and Hampson is certainly a part of that. This, you know, uh, in, in fact, it's more of a conservatism. It's saying, you know, we, we already have very good things in the north. People are happy. The towns are happy. You know, that people are happy to work the land and stuff. Why would you offer them? silk goods and things from China and uh, Swiss chocolate and give them tourists from England that would give them money. And, you know, he's, he's opposed to all that. I mean, and certainly he's one of the first to feel that way, you know, just as Schopenhauer was one of the first to be pessimistic and Nietzsche inherited that pessimism and, you know, everyone else did. This is, this is the first reaction in the late 19th century um, in the North of Europe against Against philosophical progress and industrial now, progress, these, these and political progress. These, these guys are not joining in in this uh, in this movement that they think is a very negative thing or destructive thing. They're not joining in and and participating in in the so-called profit. But do you think that they're doing their work, their writing, simply to register their protest for? art or do they do they think that they're going to have an influence do they think that they're going to make a difference well i i would i would bet that i you know in, in the beginning stages of industrialization it probably seemed that is this thing going to stick i mean are are, are are is the whole world going to be transformed are people really going to go with this thing i bet that they were thinking well you know maybe if i speak out against it, it this will change we can go back to a, a better way of life whether that was even really an option but I mean, now, 100, 150 years later, we, we, we've accepted this idea of progress, technological progress, as definitive and unstoppable. Uh, and it's just gathered steam. And so uh, you're just silly. You're viewed as silly for contradicting it. I mean, Hampson certainly wasn't viewed as silly for, for attacking it or questioning it. Nietzsche... Uh, as well, and any of those other guys, those Germans or whoever it was. But now it's, I mean, you you won't make a name for you yourself uh, attacking it. You, you'll be nothing. You're not even. You wouldn't even be called a, a luddite or anything. You just be. You just be dismissed. I mean, this is how things are going. The capitalists and the financiers and everybody they've been victorious. But I mean, the the thing is, is though the the system they've created. Um, is sowing the seeds of its own destruction, um, you know, and the various the various bubbles that have popped and and things like that. And the next one, presumably, will be even worse. But the the whole idea of these people, though, is that they if they can just create enough enough uh, momentum, no alternative will even be thought of. Even the people suffering will abide by um, a reset of the same system, and so. Perhaps a few oligarchs are sacrificed and their wealth is taken, but for the most part, things can continue on. And I mean, that's a very bad place to be. That's where we're at now. So I, I don't know if there's an alternative and, and there's no any way to stop it um, other than death and destruction. But I think the better way to stop it is, is it's just simply that what Hampson is calling for and what these other people are calling for is if there is going to be an alternative, it's going to emerge from people who are impoverished, who have no money, who have no access to capital, who have no access to technology, who have no access to anything anymore, who are forced by sheer circumstance to redevelop an idea of a local community and a local and a village and things like that to to go back to the rural way of life and to have to live that way. Now, are they going to be able to go hunting and fishing? No, there aren't animals to s- sustain that. And there's been pollution no, enough o- that it's o- very difficult Open a to casino that. or an oil and gas refinery on an Indian reservation, which is where a lot of these tri- – a lot of these uh, – a lot of these – Yeah, I don't a lot, know. A lot of I mean, these Indians who didn't get involved in alcohol, they got they got their fucking MBAs and they uh, they went into the casino and oil and gas business. 
Well, I mean, that's just a flip side, though. To that's just the same system, though. That's been that's going on in the the white areas and the cities and everything. It's no different. I'm I'm talking about like some rebirth of something truly local will come from people who are 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 completely impoverished. It may be that whatever is reborn locally is something that's so abhorrent and so disgusting and so awful um, that no one would even really embrace it from a position of wealth. But it also could be like something like, you know, something beautiful. Like, I mean, look like what came out of the Bronx in the late seventies, like rap music and stuff like that. People just taking junk and, you know, you know, scratching records and creating stuff. Uh, that came from nothing, you know. Yeah, and and, and capitalist society turned it into or, a or similarly dollar j- industry, jazz. Of course. I mean, these uh, these jazz the same way, you know. I mean, so there, there, there. It is possible out of out of these impover- impoverishment to create something wonderful. I mean, certainly no one ever said that Inuits up in the north had lots of money. They didn't have bank accounts. They didn't have anything. Of course, they had the natural surpluses and abundances of the land, um, but. They had art and they had all these things, uh, but the earth could sustain them. I don't know if the earth can sustain a bunch of impoverished people living in the middle of, of some city somewhere or something like that, but but certainly the human spirit, the human spirit and creativity um, and something like a local community, it keeps trying to emerge in different places. And I think the purest emergence comes from places that have been neglected by technology and finance and and and, and the Western system of progress is, is, is in, in, um, in order to I've, I've always struggled with the concept of surplus it's been something that uh, it, it, it's it's like the concept of God you you really it's it's very profound you know you have to address it um, but I felt like I've only been able to understand surplus over days um, and right when I get it I wake up in the morning and I, I forgot what I what I realized but in, in order to understand your concept of surplus I had to go back and um, I was reading a lot of the stuff that um, you had told me to read, um, Brody and, and, and Carpenter, and um, I spent a lot of time just looking at um, drawings. And one of the one of the things that struck me was was the whale, and I thought to myself, well, okay, look, Marlene's writing about um, grain surplus, right? He's talking about farming, but let's let's even avoid the 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 technology that was required to grow and then store. Let's just talk about the concept of abundance. You got you got a lot of stuff and you you don't have to you don't have to work, right? And you could store it and preserve it. And I thought to myself that that certainly can't be his point. There has to be a, another step because if if you if you can hunt a whale and there's no one else competing for that and the whale will feed you and you can preserve you, it's it's not abundance it's not having too much water or too much wood or too much meat it's some technological contrivance which is then menacing which forces people to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do and i remember when i was um waiting for a yeah but the the concept the concept of surplus is about um having a lot of something which enables something else so the surplus is not so much that you have a bunch of grain. This is this is the this is it's this is that, the direction I'm, I'm going in. So yeah, f- finish. But then I, I need to pick up on my step two. Right. I mean to have a to have a whale and to have a lot to eat over a couple of weeks' time is not really a surplus unless it were to enable, you know, trading trading the meat for a telegraph, um, which enabled you to do this and to do that, which I, I suppose is the idea of some idea of progress, which is that you. You're, you're taking excesses and flipping them into other things, which create further excesses, which, which, but this you is, know, I guess this surplus is, this is, is why surplus begetting surplus. Sur- surplus is it, a good, is, is, is a good term, but it seems to me that, um, a lot of your work has focused on, on fiat currencies and you can have an example of, um, a nation state that is resource poor, but is flush with a currency and a fiat currency. But because they have well defined their nation state through the legal system and through these uh, actors that you call financiers, they're able to um, gerrymander resources and direct the activities of others. They have they have what is now called power. 
And so the surplus that they have is in great distinction from the surplus of something real, that is to say grain or whale. Well, that's totally true. I mean, that's totally true. Look, I mean, look, look at the United States by, I mean, when you get rid of the gold standard, you, 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 you really make it possible for surpluses to exist without underlying resources or underlying physical surpluses that were, you know, whether it was grain originally or whatever it was. And now we have surpluses created by money flows, which are based upon the hope that, you know, this or that interest rate but, will go but down. But don't you, I mean, it's, don't you, it's, don't, it's totally don't you then system. think that your use of surplus is, is highly italicized? I mean, it is, you're using it in an ironical term because you, we, we, we can all agree on what, what the original surplus was. It was grains. But isn't, isn't there almost another term? Or, or, or is, is your point to... Uh, I suppose you're right. I suppose you're right. I mean, to say that, to say that having a lot of grain and, and being able to trade the grain for something is the same as uh, creating a bunch of laws and starting a war with another country and then, and then doing some, uh, some debt issuances and creating some tranches and you know, feeding pension funds money to have money for this and that and, and, and constructing this very complex system of essentially a three-card money game where no one really knows where the, the real surplus is hidden under which cup, you know, whether it's this cup or that cup or that cup, you know? That's the whole essence I, of three-card money. So, so and, when I was writing about surplus, trying to figure out what you were trying to say, my reaction was that you just were being a provocateur. You were, you were, you were using this example to get people to think about what was now happening with the fiat currencies. And then my reaction to that is I said, you, you, were, you were leading us to then think about transformation. And it, perhaps it could lead to technology and perhaps you, you, you could talk about technology, but it was an attack on the earth and a transformation of the earth as opposed to living on and with the earth, having helpful and hurting spirits that were personal and, and, and living in, 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 in one narrative that was self-directed or community-directed. But it seems like this surplus really represents a very cynical view of, of, of what is out there, what we can have, and what we can use. The, the whale would never be enough. The grain would never be enough. It, it is there, you, you have to transform not just the things we use, but the people that we are. And that's, the, I think, the ultimate question of, of where we're going is why and how are we transforming the earth, ourselves, our language, everything, and why are we comfortable with that? It almost seems to be that the contrast between the helping and the hurting spirits and then these outside gods, the unfamiliar gods, this concept of um, omniscience, omnipotence, um, omnipresence, this is something that was very foreign to the quote-unquote gods of the Inuit, and it's it's one of those words, God with a capital G or gods with a lowercase g. They're they're, they're night and day. These drawings that they would make of of their helping and hurting spirits almost just seem like they were they were they were friends. Some of them menacing, some of them boisterous, um, some of them kind of jokesters, but some of them wise. And and the fact that some of these helping and hurting spirits were actually the deceased uh, grandparents that then re-embodied themselves in children, in the newborn. This is, is isn't that narrative, and isn't this concept of the god completely different than these external narratives of the warring gods or the or the omniscient, omnipish, omniscient omnipotent deities? I mean, if you if you look at the story of Zeus, or if you look at the story of the Judeo-Christian gods, or even of the of the Hindu gods, these are some scary ass narratives that have nothing in common with well, the helping and hurting I think spirits. We, I think we as Westerners, I think we as Westerners tend to group um, gods and spirits. I think you've discussed this before, as gods and spirits and all this stuff tends to get grouped together, and it shouldn't be grouped together. And uh, you know, Brody had that great book. Um, and, and when you ask when you ask the question when you ask the question who were the gods, this was one of your original questions. Did you ask that question to get people to think about the difference in helping and hurting spirits and mono, and, and monotheism, or were you asking, uh, or, or was it such know. a general question that it was just it was just getting a, lar- a very large conversation started? 
don't, I don't know. I think, I think a lot of this still it, we, there's certain difficulties with language, our language that, um, allow, that cause us to group metaphysical beings or, or, I mean, even the words we're using right now, I mean, we tend to, we would tend to, to think that they were going together, but at least, at least as Brody reports in Maps and Dreams and in other books, um, Inuit, Inuit Eskimo people had no problem embracing God and Jesus Christ within the framework of all of their other helping and hindering spirits and divinities. They had no problem at all because they, they didn't view them as competing in any way. They actually didn't view them on the same... I don't even know how to really describe it, but they didn't view them as being exclusive to one another. Whereas the, the priests who came wanted to destroy the helping and hindering spirits and talk of those things and replace them with Jesus Christ and God and all of that, they kind of really missed the point. And I, I think it's still kind of misunderstood what, uh, what Eskimos were talking about with their helping and hindering spirits uh, within this context, because we just, we just tend to think that this wouldn't allow for a place for Jesus and God and the Bible and scripture. And it, it's not the case no, at I, all. They, they don't, they don't view the, the two as being uh, competing. I, I've never asked you this question, but um, in in your earlier work, you talked about the um, multiplicity of gods. And again, I, I don't think I quite understood at the time. I probably need to revisit your work, what what you were referring to. But you referred to a multiplicity of gods that were replaced by um, single icons or or, or or the the saints of the church were replacing... Um, historical pagan gods. Oh, there's a lot of evidence for that. A lot but of my, evidence my, for my that. My question um, is... All of the... Okay. Yeah, but all of... all Like Easter and all of these religious holidays don't come from the Bible. They, you know they come from pagan traditions. And the only way that the church could get these pagan people to accept Jesus Christ was to, to offer them, yeah, you can still have the festival, but we're going to do it now for... St. Peter and the resurrection of Christ and um, all, all of the, uh, the, the pagan roots of the Bible are huge. That's one of the reasons the church was always very um, violent against new heresies that were built off old pagan customs. Um, any pagan, you know, so-called pagan or heretical interpretation of scripture was immediately put down with violence because the, the idea was is that paganism could easily return. But the church certainly had to embrace paganism at least um, superficially, uh, and, and, and insert its own uh, biblical traditions uh, into the, the pagan framework to get these heathens to become Christians. It was the only way to do it. Um, so, uh, I mean, Christians, Christians are in denial about their, their, their pagan heritage. It's, it's very strong. Now, but very, the, very strong. The, the, the question that, that, that I have, and I don't know if this has ever been addressed in your, in your writing, were these gods similar to these um, new gods, but the only difference is that the multiplicity of the gods had been reduced? In other words, it, it seems to me by reading Hesiod that the gods that he wrote about, these, this beautiful history, the multiplicity of all these gods, were very, very powerful and otherworldly. They were always coming from the heavens. They lived almost eternal lives. They had supernatural powers. Um, they were without suffering and imperfections, and um, they they certainly had nothing in common with these uh, fragile and perhaps ephemeral helping and hurting spirits of the Inuit. You couldn't develop a relationship with these gods and, and, and make it up as you went along. They didn't kind of appear in some chapter of your life during a hunt or during a death or during a, a journey or during a, a summer um, the, these these were things that were planted upon you. They were stories, or maybe things that people saw at one time, but they were stories about something that instilled awe and wonder and, and perhaps fear. And I almost think that these Judeo-Christian monotheistic traditions that try to say, no, there's only one God, take away all the other stories. But it was almost as if this one God that replaced the other gods the other gods were on a similar plane. They were all external, omniscient, omnipotent, powerful, not of the earth. And the the goal of the Christianity or the Muslim religion or, or whatever was to get everyone to stop thinking about 
the other gods and just pick one. Well, that this was I, I've written a little bit about this in some aphorisms, which is about the idea of the one God and the where the appearance, the first appearance of the idea that there can only be a single exclusive God to worship and the rest are wrong and the rest should be destroyed and killed. And that's a relatively new idea. Most most of these older so-called pagan religions were very open to all kinds of gods. Um, and, you know, even the Roman Empire prior to its conversion to Christianity uh, with Constantine uh, tolerated all sorts of religious diversity. I mean, it, they had no problem with any of it. Um, and in fact, they were a little bothered by the Christians and persecuted the Christians because the Christians were projecting this idea of the one God and trying to change everybody. And that bothered the Romans who were pagans and were open to everybody. So, I mean, if there's anyone who's against diversity, it's really the monotheistic religions. Um, and that is our heritage. And I, you know, I think this monotheism infects everything we think. We tend to think of things in terms of a, a, a winner take all, uh, which is the spirit of capitalism, which is the spirit of Christianity, which is the spirit of Islam. Um, and, in, and in many ways, it's the spirit of any warring, uh, global warring cultural phenomenon, um, which is not at all the, 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 the attitude of Native Americans now, or Inuit do you, or do you, Hindus or you, Greeks or early Romans. You're, you're very familiar with the, um, with, with the New Testament. Who, do you remember who wrote Corinthians? Was it Paul? I don't know. Well, yeah, I don't, well I don't know. because my, my, my question to you is, is Christianity trying to say that there are no gods? Or are they trying to say, just pick one because that's the one to go with? Because I, I, I read... Corinthians last week, and there's a chapter in Corinthians, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, and this is, again, I'm dealing with translation, so this is probably something that uh, I need to learn the, the Aramaic or the Greek, whatever that it was written in, but it's, it's this chapter, it's called Concerning Food Sacrifice to Idols, and he, and he writes, now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, and that's in quotes. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. Okay, so love God. Okay, love God, and then he knows you, right? So have a devotion to God. Love God. That's, that's great, right? So then about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world. I, I don't know what that means. Does that mean that an idol has no relevance, that it's fake or that it's false? And this is where I think that there's something that he almost is, is showing his colors or is almost e expressing uncertainty. There is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods... For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, and why does he say that? Whether in heaven or on earth, as in, and then he says, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. Hmm. Yet for us, Admitting. yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came, and from whom we live. And there is but one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live. I'm almost interpreting that as don't get distracted by all these gods that were once here. Choose one because that's the best way to go or perhaps they're the ones in power now. That external power is now in power now. Go with that one. The other ones are gone. That narrative is not going to help you. Or I, I, I just, this is such a different story than the helping and hurting spirits. And it's, it's basically saying, don't even read the history of the gods anymore. And, and when I say the history of the gods, I'm, I'm speaking of Hesiod, Zeus, and, um, and, and, and all, of the, uh, all of the players in, in ancient Greek philosophy, which is but when not did, ancient Greek philosophy, I mean, ancient, is, ancient. Is, is there ever Is there ever any evidence um, that the gods of the Greeks or the 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 spirits of the the Inuit or the tri, uh, native tribes that some divinity or god or spirit came to them and commanded them 
to refrain from identifying with or worshiping other gods or calling upon other spirits. Or, so, I mean, so I, 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 I can just, ta- I can tackle I that I can tackle that question if you'd like me to, and I can do it briefly. Yeah. So, um, with the Inuit, I don't believe there was any um, external power uh, directing them or, or telling them to codify their conduct. But with the Greeks, I believe that was exactly the case. Um, Hesiod was an illiterate farmer, and he came after a period uh, of, of the Greek Dark Ages, after the Mycenaean period. And, and, and Dark Ages is, was, was, can be literally defined as an absence of lamps. Something happened over an 800-year period such that there was a, no evidence of actual oil lamps. I mean, people were literally in a primitive Dark Ages. Something happened to Greek society. Um, I, don't, I don't know what happened. It was some, something very violent happened. But the language of the Mycenaean Greeks was so foreign to Hesiod that he wouldn't have been able to speak that Greek. That's how much time had passed. But he gave a story which was absolutely consistent and verbatim of Babylonian and Assyrian god stories. And for this guy to be able to write in a new language, um, an illiterate man, to write in a new language and tell stories that were verbatim from the Babylonians and the Assyrians and ancient um, Egyptians is, is, is very interesting. Um, but these gods um, did create and shape uh, humans. They created humans. And Works and Days was a wisdom story about how to organize your affairs. It was how to plant, how to live, how to manage slaves, how to dress yourself, how to build shelter, and form society. It also, interestingly enough, was some had, had a very strong libertarian tone in, in, in that it warned against the gift eaters, that is to say the, the, the politicians. Do not try to settle your affairs with politicians. They'll just get in your affairs and, and take from you and your neighbors. And a dispute that you think will be resolved will actually just result in less of your freedom and keeping in less of your stuff, that is to say your stored grain. Um, he also was very much against going out to sea. He hated the ocean. He hated sailing. His father was a sailor. Uh, so I, 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 th- I think that these, these Greek gods that were Babylonian and Assyrian, perhaps Hindu, the, 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 these nine gods, these nine main powers, they appear all over the world. Um, they all had in common the omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence of the uh, the Judeo-Christian God. But it seems to me that the Judeo-Christian tradition is trying to tell people to um, stop paying attention to these other gods, and these other gods were not helping and hurting spirits. They had very, very common characteristics with... But don't, don't you think part of, part of, our, part of our issue is that when when we try to do these analysis of of gods, let's say we're we're first off we're we're doing it backwards. We're we're beginning with a tradition we're familiar with, which is in a very exclusive tradition, which is this monotheism, which is very codified, and we're looking we're looking back with this as the as the compare as this as the thing which we're going to compare to uh, at these other traditions. And we're just not able to get inside these other traditions to to have their view of this new monotheism which might, ar- might arrive or these new demands of new gods upon them or even the idea that a god could 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 make a demand to forget other gods. It's just I, I think I think we're hamstrung. I think we're just hamstrung by uh, being stuck in uh, in our own tradition. And this tradition is 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 within the language itself. It's within the, the structure of the, this whole world we have. Uh, I mean, the way we, way we speak and the way but we I, think I almost, and all I of it. I almost think that it is a, it is a, it is a result of one, one God winning and the, then, the, then the further movement to this binary culture of zeros and ones. It is, it is to simplify... Well, according to... I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've ever... I don't know if you, how much you've read of John Graves... Very good uh, British philosopher. Perhaps the perhaps the best philosopher alive today is John Gray. I would say, best living philosopher. Uh, he he believes that Christianity has been victorious, and the whole Christian model has been incorporated into everything. Uh, 
whether it's capitalism, uh, uh, wh whatever it is, uh, the whole idea of progress is a Christian idea. Um, the, the transformation of our idea of, of the passage of time is a Christian idea, teleology. Um, he gets into all of these ideas. Marxism, of course, as you know, is a, is a very Christian idea. Uh, everyone, is, everyone is doing some variant on Christianity. So Christianity has been victorious even among the atheists, even among the professed agnostics, it's been victorious. Uh, so it's, it's very hard then to say, can we, can we talk about or analyze any of these other things? I don't really think we can. I mean, I think the best, the best way if you want to know about the helping and hindering spirits is learn a nupiate and go on a hunt and uh, spend a lot of time there and you'll, under, you'll get an understanding. You may never be able to express it in English or in concepts which, are, which, which, which a university in, in the lower 48 would use, um, but you will know about something, and I and I'm sure that it will have nothing to do with monotheism. We're, we're asking these we're asking so these I, questions with a with the very mindset that was created by the the victory of this of this one God. This our 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 language, our our mathematical framework is is we're, we're attempting to you know a anthropology itself. It's it's going in and 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 spying on something different than us, but we're always giving our story with the lens that was that was created based on the victory of this of this well of this i think Christian that's why, perspective. that's why we we've said it before we've said it before about edmund carpenter i think that's why he abandoned anthropology because he he had hoped that he could somehow get outside of the whole the whole practice of of western anthropology and really get something genuine but there was no way to do it uh and Brody, Brody as well. I mean, I think Brody's lying to himself if he thinks that he was ever able to really articulate anything about his experiences. And in fact, I think he was endangering cultures by articulating those experiences. As Scott says, exposing hidden transcripts, which he should never have exposed. I mean, I hope Scott is keeping a lot back. I mean, he shouldn't expose this shit. Be, be, He's putting because these, if, these, these hill people if, at if risk you're, if, by, by telling them, by right. telling the state how they're evading state right. surveillance. Well. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely it, wrong in a moral It, it, it reminded me of reading this um, volume of articles that was published by Northwestern University Press, this anthropological volume. And I, and I thought, the, these anthropologists are, are, are really bad, but I'm glad they're really bad because they, they can't get their heads out of their own asses. And so they're, they're a very little risk to exposing the hidden transcripts of the... Uh, people they're trying to observe and they're, they're, they're very poor spies. They're, they're not giving away any secrets because they haven't um, transformed their own souls in, in, in actually adapting to these cultures. But the better the anthropologist you are, the more you're going to lose your, your Western lens. And you're going to begin to say, you're going to begin to think like the people that you're trying to understand. And that will lead to pre-linguistic pre experience. In other words, you will ditch writing you will ditch reporting. You will ditch going back to the university or giving an update or writing an article. And you will literally drop out of Western society and disappear and lose your linguistic Western background. That is the well, that is the perfect th that is the, the question, perfect though. anthropologist the is that anthropology, if done correctly, would lead to the very demise of anthropology. But Right. That's if that's if you're legitimately looking for another form of life and you and you want to live another way and the and the reality is the sad reality is is that Hugh Brody didn't really want to live another way he didn't he had a return ticket and, and what, I, what you would call the return ticket he had a return ticket exactly um carpenter i i i think i think in, he really did genuinely want to live another way and although he had a and though he did return i'm not sure he had a return ticket i think he just he just couldn't he just he he tried and he failed to 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 become a part of something. He wanted to, um, and the best thing that he realized he could do was just to shut the fuck up and stop writing, not reveal any more hidden transcripts, not allow any more state actors to go in and destroy local cultures. Just shut the fuck up and get out of the way and say nothing more. That I mean, and that and that took courage. I mean, Carpenter disappeared. Do and, do uh, do you do you do you think that could have been a very important? This is guy. I mean, this is. This almost seems to be like the the realization of, of all thinking. I mean, if we're talking about 
accounting for human experience and human happiness, the secret of Western happiness or, or the Western destiny is that if you find that that path outside of whatever is frustrating our happiness, it means you, you called it shitting out shitting out the West, but it almost means a destruction of the very thing that gives us power as Western people. Yeah, but I mean, how do you, I mean, look, it's, it's a fucked up project. If you want to get rid of your language, get rid of your whole culture, get rid of everything and try and live a whole new way. I, I don't even know if that's possible. I, I it's, it's, it's perhaps possible in some small ways. I mean, you can, you know, Nietzsche touches on it. Nietzsche touches on it in a very indirect way. He talks about moving to a foreign culture and and reinventing um, yourself in another in another foreign culture. And he said the parents will be weak and ineffective, but the next generation will be the strongest. Now that's just really moving from one Western culture to another. And I think it's probably he's probably speaking of you know moving to Argentina in 1850 or moving to America um, or moving to India or moving to Australia in 1850 or something. Well, he's, he's, he's right. He's right in the sense though, that it's something that you probably couldn't do in your own lifetime. You would have to, it would you're, be a multi-generational It's, it's multi-generational. And, and if you look you know? at that, I mean, um, I, I, but so few, but so few, but within our culture, we don't think anymore in terms of generations or, 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 or multi-generations within a community as being able to accomplish something. We no longer have that sense with the idea of the individual. The idea of the individual is the other main element here, which is something that just doesn't exist in these other places. The strong idea of the individual. And, and I mean, our whole language is attuned to it. I mean, it, it, and again, the whole idea of the one and the victorious one God. You, you encountered well. It applies also yeah. as the as the as the individual, the victorious. Well, individual. you wrote you wrote you about know. this in your 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 work on Arjun. Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos will finally own all the money and all of the Indeed. capital. You know, that's yeah. the goal. But that's you, the goal you, of you capitalism. Wrote, that Jeff Bezos will be you, victorious. You wrote about the individual when you were talking about uh, Argentina. You. Um, you, you, you spoke about how they, they just don't understand this this unhappiness that leads people to travel like you did. That the, the, the concept of wanting to be alone just didn't make sense to them. They were, they were happy. You, the, heart, the hardest chasm to bridge in, in meeting these people yeah, that lived the, in the middle of nowhere the is they, they were said, happy. I, I didn't travel. I traveled. I traveled. I had to travel because I felt alone. Uh, the whole idea of travel was to not be alone anymore. I mean, there's nothing more lonely than being in a place surrounded by people and having connection with nothing. I mean, that's just that just goes against the whole spirit of humanity as it's always been. And that's what the cities are today. So, I mean, a guy gets on his bike and he goes and he rides into the wind in a place where he knows nobody and can hardly and speak the language. And he's finally happy. He probably feels... He probably feels less alone at that moment than he did surrounded by people who won't talk to him or now, look at him. Now, do you, do you believe you know? that that was the first time that you actually were in touch with helping and hurting spirits? No. I, I, that's the thing about the natural world. I, I, I spent a lot of time in Wisconsin fishing and uh, alone fishing, and I was never alone. I mean, I say alone. It was just me, but I was, I was, I was always comforted. There were always things happening. There were forces that were beyond me, um, things moving. There was rhythms and all sorts of stuff. I mean, all this. That's one of the reasons I respond so well to Hampson is that he he cites these same things that I I've always known. Um, like I knew when I could get a, I could catch a fish. I knew where the fish were. Like you could bring me to the lake, and I knew what I could catch. I knew what I would catch before I caught it. And I I just became so attuned in a way. And that was as a boy. And and so. Um, there's something about the hunt. I mean, I don't, I've never hunted game before, but I've fished. I've killed thousands of fish in my life and caught them and eaten them and filleted this, them. The strange irony and about that's your, not including the Alaska. strange irony about your life is that you, you're, you're, you're writing about all these things that have, that, that are, that are going to uncover, I think a lot of philosophical problems, but the, the, the initiation for you to, do, to make to make these observations was a very violent event that happened in your life where you moved from a, a working class background where you had access to nature, you know, in Wisconsin to 
really the, the the belly of the beast, which was the outskirts of Chicago, where you know these were the people that created the Chicago Board Options Exchange, well, and I didn't, Mercantile I didn't, Exchange. And- I, I left. Uh, I should I should mention I left. I left. I left. Uh, Wisconsin. I never lived in, in, in the natural world, really. Even when I was in Wisconsin, I was born in Green Bay and I left there when I was three. And then I lived in Michigan. Um, there was quite a bit of forest, though, where I lived in Michigan, even though it was a city, Lansing, the capital. There was still, you know, it wasn't built up. We would go into the woods. There was wild. And um, my family still had a lot of land, which you've been up to, on to in Wisconsin. So I was spending a lot of time up there as well. But I never, I never really lived in really wild places. I just, I just would go there, and I was drawn to them. And, 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 um, and, but and I have enough, enough to at least cities. whet your appetite that there was something outside of the city. Yeah, I, I would say. I mean, one of the reasons I like Hemingway a lot is because I think he grew up in a similar way. He spent a lot of time in the summers and his time off fishing and hunting and and, and in the wild, and he really I loved it. But he he lived. The majority of his life in a in a more urban environment, um, and didn't like that urban environment, and saw the differences. But he could he could speak the language of the wild and speak the language of the city. And I I feel and I feel Jesus the same Christ, way. and the, I think Hampson is Hampson is the, the trajectory. Same way. You know, he's the trajectory who, that you went on, though, if you consider it. I mean, you he went to New York City to then Miami. You almost. I mean, if you were a rocket, you would you would reach the top and then it exploded or expired or something. I mean, I think this is almost when you created this term morally and free. This is when everything began. It was when you had left. You were a financier. What is, what, what is the term financier? Finance. How do you say it? <laughs> I wasn't a financier. Yes, you were. You were a. You were a. No, I was just a yeah, trader. But, but I mean, you were you were working with these some of the most complicated instruments and relationships and movements. I mean, you were, you were in the, the pulse of, of, well, of their, of their, I mean, of if their you're world. Technical, if you're technical about it, I was, but the reality of what I was doing was, it was just a bunch of shifting numbers on a screen and you, you just look for patterns and you exploited them and you had the balls to click a mouse and not worry about losing money. It was someone else's money anyway. So fuck it. I mean, that's what it was. A monkey could have done it. We were all monkeys, trained monkeys. Uh, so, it, I mean, it was impressive in the sense that very few people could do it. Um, but then again, very few people could uh, stand at the free throw line on a basketball court and make eight out of ten free throws. Uh, so, I'd put it in the same context as that, you know. The uh, yeah, so hit, hit, hitting a three pointer is the same thing as uh, making uh, 20, 20, 20, well, 20, 20, 20 grand on uh, on not one spread one three. Pointer. Yeah. Not hitting one three pointer, but being able to to do it consistently uh, at a at a pretty high level. I mean, there's you start to reduce the amount. I mean, any physical, I, it's it's comparable to physical sports and things because you you have few people that can do something at a very high level. I mean, look at what you, look what you can do. You're able to run at a high speed. I mean, you're starting to talk about a a much smaller percentage of human beings who can be able to do something like that. Hey. Well, perhaps trading is even a smaller percentage. But by, by the way, get, get, guess uh, what I'm doing on July fourth. Ah, uh, you're probably running somewhere. I'm gonna run Mount Marathon. Wait, in, in yeah. Alaska? Really? It's Im- you're going yeah, up there. I'm 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 training for Mount Marathon on July 4th, and uh, <laughs> it's uh it's uh I, I my my goal is very modest. It's just, it's just to break an hour. The guys the guys that win run uh, in the low 40s, um, and it's it's. Yeah, there's some it's, badasses. It's a, it's there's it's badasses, it's it's it's, sure. it's actually danger. There's there's a, there's a the fastest way to get down the mountain is to is to take the uh, the cliffs, and if you uh, yeah, it's to fall, just roll down. Yeah, the but no, the, the there are some there are <laughs> some there are some you'll, you'll eight, eight to minutes. fourteen foot drops, and so if you don't have a background in climbing, I've actually um, gotten a little bit better at climbing. Um, my my typical trail races that I win, there's there's re- there's really no risk of actually like breaking your neck or getting a concussion or dying but this race um if, if you fuck up you can you can become brain damaged but uh the well some guy some guy got killed a few yeah years ago. he he was uh, he was think, some loser who i think a bear yeah he wandered off the mountain he was he was a but um yeah i'm i'm, I'm actually gonna have to pay two thousand dollars to 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 do this race because there's a lottery um 
that's there's right. a lottery and they they so they, they lotter they 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 um they auction off tickets and if if your bid is between two and three thousand dollars you'll 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 win for me that's that's like that's cheap that's fucking cheap because um you can't ever race mount marathon without um you can't ever get in you can't you can't ever get in the all the legacy racers are the ones that are admitted but um it's it's the greatest trail race uh i think in in in, in the whole country and the fact that no, are are you gonna uh, are you gonna stop by the cannery? This is the thing. I I watched. Um, I was working um, on the bins the day of the race, and I saw. It was funny. I saw the racers go up the mountain in their fluorescent vests, and I remember the slime line passage. So here I am working in the very cannery that you had written about, and you had written about either in your book or in some other narratives and uh and i and i thought boy it would, it would be nice to be outside today i was inside breathing in ammonia and uh but now I, i'm i'm actually going to be outside and i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to do the race i want to finish in the, the like the top 20 or something like that and uh but i don't know what i what i'm going to do when i finish i think um i'll probably limp on up you probably go to the breeze You'd well i might i might go to the breeze but um I might just try to see if Carl's in a slip and just climb on over, oh, climb on over and, and oh, maybe say, Hey, yeah. let's, let's go on a trip or let's drink a beer. <laughs> but, um, I, I might, I might, I, I might get, I might get punched. I might show up in the dock and start operating the crane. I might just hijack a forklift. I might, <laughs> uh, I might start, uh, messing with the bins upstairs. I might climb up the ladder. I want to see if, uh, Oh, they would they would take you back. They would take you back for a week. I want to see if Charlie's there. I want to see if the Wolfman's still there. Um, maybe I'll just get some break. Wolf. Maybe I'll just get some break room coffee. Um, but I don't <laughs> I don't expect to uh, be accepted if I'm wearing my running clothes. So I might have to put on some. I might have to put on some. Uh, just get some uh, get some rain yeah, gear. I might go up. to the yeah. I might go to the the Ace and and get some get some rain gear and wander in and. Uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of the only thing uh, I I'm I'm in the I think I'm in the final year of my my recapitalization project, and uh, I need to be disciplined and, and and stick with it. I want to leave now. I want to go up to northern Brazil now, but I, I can't do it. It's, it's stupid. I can make I can make too much capital by just lasting one more year. But uh, it would be good. It would be good to see Alaska again. And, and you've been up Mount Marathon. I mean, it is. Um. It it it. Uh, I didn't go to the top. I didn't go to the top. I went with Chris, and Chris. Uh, fucking Chris. Chris climbed up the side of Mount Marathon, like on the rocks. I watched him up there. I mean, it was. I thought he was gonna I, die. I, I I climbed Mount I, Marathon with Chris. Did he go up the side of the rocks like he was like literally climbing the side of? A yeah. Rock so face? that you 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 get Is over it, the false top and then you have. A very steep area to go. It's it's actually not that bad to to go up. Um, well, we didn't we didn't use a trail. Like when we, he and I went up there, there was there was a lot of snow, so we couldn't find a trail. So we just started climbing up the mountain. We were just walking up the mountain. It got very very yeah. steep. And Chris, Chris and I um, actually um, the some some days when they have the race, some years there's snow at the top, and the fastest way down is to actually slide down the snow for a certain section. And both he and I did that. Ah, oh. well, you, you've done more than I have. I, I left Chris on the, uh, I watched Chris go up the mountainside and like rocks were falling off and bounding down the side where I was. So I got out of the way. I just, I just left him and I figured, well, if I don't hear him in a, I hear from him in like a day or something, he's not back to work tomorrow. Uh, he probably got killed. Chris, Chris to took a different parents. descent and I, 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 uh, I was less ambitious than he was. And so, um, there's, the, the more dangerous section he took was less dangerous when it's, when it's, um, wet. I took a section that, um, it was full of sharp rocks and mud and all you would do is slide and get cut. So I had cuts on my elbows, cuts on my hands, cuts on my knees. And it took Chris 30 minutes to get down the mountain. It took me, um, 55 minutes to get up and an hour and 15 minutes to get down. And he was, um, finishing his dinner <laughs> And I got into the canteen, and oh, this is when they were serving that hockey puck meat. And uh, I actually, uh, 
just ate the salad bar and, and almost didn't eat the meat even though I was starving. And then I think I went over to Safeway to, to actually get a rotisserie chicken or something like that. But, but Chris, uh, he made the better choice that day. Yeah, fucking, yeah. fucking hell. Chris. Hey, uh, we're, uh, we're coming up on three this hours. This is, yeah. Want to shut down? Yeah, we're, uh, you want to do it at uh, 2.55? Uh, we could do it right now. It doesn't yeah. matter. Um, let's, um, 